This is the clerk with a courtesy announcement that the meeting is now live on the internet. Good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Rhonda. Can you hear me all right? I sure can. It's going to be a great meeting today. Thank you. Yes, it is. Good morning, Robin. Morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Robin. Morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you.
Good morning, Larry. I'm going to say good morning for my boss. Um, he stepped out of the office. Great. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. And okay. we can see you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> good morning, Supervisor Samidian. Good morning. Can you hear me loud and clear, Rhonda? I sure can. Have a lovely meeting. Thank you so much. Thanks for your help. All Wait, right. Okay. Rhonda. Recording in progress. Rhonda, do we have Supervisor Lee? Uh, we do have Supervisor Lee. Okay, Five Supervisor minutes. Chavez is going to be 10 minutes late. It's 9.30. So, um, Actually, it looks like Supervisor Chavez's office just arrived. Yes, so, she's here, as is Supervisor Ellenberg. Your clerk today is going to be the lovely Peggy Doyle. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, everybody. Let's uh, get this meeting started with a roll call, please, Peggy. Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to item number two, which is Pledge of Allegiance. I'd ask all those that are able to stand to do so. And I'm going to turn to Supervisor Chavez to lead us in this morning's pledge. Please rise if you're able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Supervisor Chavez. We're now going to turn to Supervisor Lee for our invocation. Supervisor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good morning. I would like to... Uh, uh, introduce for today's invocation uh, to introduce Rabbi Dana Maget to do the invocation. Rabbi Dana Maget became the senior rabbi for the Imanu El Temple on July 1999. Prior to that, he served four years as an associate rabbi at the Congregation Beth Israel in San Diego. Rabbi Maget's, uh, Maget's uh, first pulpit was in Miami before he was assistant rabbi and director of education for Temple Israel of Greater Miami. And before his own nation, he earned a master's in education from Fingerhead School of Education at the University of Judaism in Los Angeles. Currently, Rabbi serves as the chair of the Interfaith Council on Economics and Justice for Santa Clara County. He also serves as a board member of Hillel of Silicon Valley, Chai House, the Jewish Community Center, and California Board of Rabbis, as well as various other communities. Um, and th thank you, Rabbi, for joining us today and providing today's invocation. Go ahead. Thank you for this honor, Supervisor Lee. Well, my friends, later this month <clears throat> will be Yom HaShoah, which is Holocaust, Holocaust Remembrance Day. When we think of the Holocaust, we remember, of course, the 6 million Jews, 1.5 million of which were children who were systematically murdered by the Nazis. But the Holocaust also included an additional 10 million plus people who were gypsies, homosexuals, physically or mentally disabled, anyone who spoke up against Nazism, and the righteous Gentiles who tried to make a difference. Yom HaShoah is a day to remember this horrific time that impacted so many people and continues to impact us today. Yom HaShoah is a reminder to us of what humanity can do to each other when we are out of control, when we abdicate our responsibilities toward each other and when we lose sight of our own humanity. The Holocaust happened like every other human tragedy because we allowed it to happen. And there is so much tragedy in our world today with new terrorist attacks in Israel, the Russian war on the Ukraine, Afghanistan's civil war and terrorist insurgency, civil wars in Ethiopia, Yemen, Colombia, Miramar, Syria, Libya, Mali, and so much more violence throughout our world. It is simply too much. And of course, the division in our own country, as we all combat racism, misogyny, growing anti-Semitism and prejudice, which is why acknowledging Yom HaShoah is so very important, for we must not forget humanity's cruelty towards humanity. When one person is mistreated, we must we respond, we must stand up for what is right, for absence of action equates to supporting the mistreatment. I am proud that I live in a county where the leadership understands this responsibility. And so let us pray 
May Yom HaShoah inspire all of us to stand up for others, especially those who are on the periphery of our community. May we speak up for the voiceless. May we act for the powerless. May we join hands with our brothers, sisters, and beloveds in this beautiful county, seeing only that which binds us and focusing less on our differences. Eloheinu velohe avotenu, our God and God of our ancestors, we ask your blessings for our country, for its government, for its leaders, and for all who exercise just and rightful authority. May the leaders of this county administer all affairs of Santa Clara County fairly, so that peace and security, happiness and prosperity, justice and freedom may forever abide in our beautiful county. May the citizens of this great county be blessed with leadership that understands that all people, regardless of religion, country of origin, gender, race, sexual orientation, physical, mental ability, and economic status are all equal and are all children of God, however they define that word. May the peoples of this county and our country forge a common bond in true harmony to banish all hatred, bigotry, ignorance, and to safeguard the ideals and values of our country. May each of us be inspired today to look within ourselves as we consider our own prejudice. May we live our lives with a strong sense of values and morality toward all people. And may that love toward each other strengthen our individual relationships with one another. Adonai oz mo yitain Adonai yivarech et amo vashalom. May the guiding spirit of the universe grant strength to each of us. And may that strength bless us with shalom, salam, wholeness, completeness, and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We're now going to move on to item number 5A, accommodations and proclamations. We have a 5A by Supervisor Lee, 5B by Supervisor Ellenberg. And I would like to ask anyone wishing to speak under item 6, public comment, to go ahead and register electronically. With that said, I turn to you again, Supervisor Lee, for a proclamation. Thank you. And I'm uh, going to present this proclamation declaring the month of April 2022 as the National Donate Life Month in Santa Clara County. In doing so, encourage all Californians to check yes when applying for or renewing the driver's license or ID card by signing up at the Donor Network West.org. The Donor Network West, the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, and the Santa Clara County Medical Examiner's Office are coordinating with our office to proclaim April as a National Donate Life Month in Santa Clara County. More than 1,500 individuals in Santa Clara County are currently on the National Organ Transplant waiting list, and 22 patients die each day due to the shortage of donated organs. The Donate Network West serves as a federally designated organ procurement organization in Northern Central California and Northern Nevada and works in close partnership with families, doctors, nurses, and coroners in hospitals to connect donors to recipients. The Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Hospital in Phoenix provide high quality, compassionate, and accessible healthcare for all persons in Santa Clara County, regardless of their social economic status and ability to pay. And in collaboration with Donor Network West, works in partnership to save and heal lives in our community through donation. Organ and tissue are life-saving acts recognized worldwide as expressions of compassion to those in need that save thousands of lives each year. The need for donated organs, especially urgent in Hispanic, Asian, and African-American communities, a single individual's donation of the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and small intestine can save up to eight lives. Donation of tissue can save and heal the lives of up to 75 others. Over 15 million Californians have signed up with the state authorized Donate Life California Registry to ensure their wishes to be organ and tissue donors are honored. So now, therefore, be resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Santa Clara does hereby recognize and proclaim the month of April 2022 as the National Donate Life Month in Santa Clara County. And in doing so, encourage all Californians to check this yes box when you're applying your driver's license and ID and signing up or don donor network west.org. And I believe we have uh, Sandy uh, Andrada 
uh, the regional director from Donor Network West to present the three organizations and the rest of the members observing on this public link. Thank you for all being here. And Sandy, if you would like to say a few words, please. Yes, thank you, Su Supervisor Lee. Sandy Andrada, I'm a director with Donor Network West. And in my 21 years here at the organization, I've seen our national waiting list grow from 50,000 to over 100,000 today. And as uh, Supervisor Lee shared, over 1,000 here waiting in Santa Clara County. Due to our close partnership with Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and the Santa Clara County Medical Examiner's Office, we're able to honor the wishes of patients and their families to donate organs and tissues at the end of life. These donations really do directly offer a second chance at life for patients here in Santa Clara County. This translates to children who are able to grow up and live full childhoods, like Penelope Cruz. She and her family live in San Jose, and because of a liver transplant, she's ready to conquer the world of elementary school. Or AJ Reyes, who because of his heart transplant, was able to complete nursing school and now works as a nurse at Stanford Healthcare, where he received his transplant. This last year, in partnership with local artists, the San Jose Downtown Association, Local Color, and other Santa Clara County organizations, we were able to complete a mural on the site of Pyre Fire, a local ceramic business. This mural honors two of our local donors, Brandon Castellanos and Nancy Gutierrez, who both died too young, but were able to leave their legacy on this earth as organ and tissue donors. This mural honors all of our Hispanic donors here in Santa Clara County, who have saved thousands of lives across the country. If you're ever in the South of Market area of San Jose, please do visit this beautiful, inspiring mural. Thank you to the Board of Supervisors for proclaiming April as National Donate Life Month. And thank you to Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and the Santa Clara County Medical Examiner's Office for their life-saving work. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Before we turn to 5B, another proclamation, this one by Vice President Ellenberg, I'm going to remind everybody again, if you wish to speak on the next item, public comment about anything not on today's agenda, please register electronically now. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. I wasn't even aware that my camera had turned off. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, it is my honor to present this proclamation on behalf of the Board of Supervisors in recognition of Black Maternal Health Week. Next week, April 11th to 17th, will be the fifth National Black Maternal Health Week organized by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Last April, the Board of Supervisors recognized Black Maternal Health Week for the first time in our county in partnership with local organizations that have long advocated for improving Black birth outcomes in our community, including the Public Health Department's Black Infant Health Program, the Roots Community Clinic, the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, and the African American Community Services Agency. And whether you come to this issue through the lens of promoting the well-being of babies and families, or from the through the issue of health equity and social justice, the stark disparities in birth, in Black birth outcomes need to be recognized and addressed. Black infants die at three times the rate of other babies. Deaths during childbirth are four times higher amongst Black birthing people than other groups. And these disparities persist even for highly educated and high income Black pregnant people. And data from the CDC shows that these disparities widened in the last year due to the impacts of, COVID of the COVID-19 pandemic on pregnant people. Last year, our board approved a significant expansion of our Black Infant Health Program and Perinatal Equity Initiative. Uh, and I'm grateful to all of my colleagues for your support. And our local health plans and hospitals have committed to partner in this work to achieve meaningful improvements. Later this month, the board will receive a progress report on that expansion. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Beverly White Macklin, Program Manager 3 from the Public Health Department. Beverly oversees the department's Black Infant Health Program, Teen Parent Support Program, Oral Health and Child Health and Disability Prevention Programs, and has served the department for over 21 years. Beverly will be joined by a client of our Black Infant Health Program, LaToya Davis. LaToya has been able to receive postpartum support from the Black Infant Health Program following the birth of her baby through the expansion of the program approved by the board last June. Bev and LaToya, I invite you to say a few words to us. 
Thank you, Supervisor Ellingberg and President, Vice President Ellingberg, and thank you to all the Board of Supervisors for the support and work that you all have, have done to improve the health and wellness of Black women in our community. I'd like to say that Black Infant Health is working to empower women and to build their resilience and stress um, by promoting healthy behaviors for our women. Um, it is so important for them to connect to with the social and medical and mental health services in our counties and to work with our partners in order to ensure that they have a chance to have optimal services that improve their birth outcomes. So it is my pleasure to introduce one of our clients, uh, Latoya Davis and her baby, Jakaila, um, who would like to talk about the experience that she has seen and how she has grown in our program. Thank you so much. Are you all able to see us? No, we cannot see you. Your camera's not on. I keep clicking it and it just there you go. There we go. And maybe Hi, tilt, Beverly. maybe tilt it down a little bit, Beverly. Yes, yes. Sorry. There we go. We have to move on. Now, hello, I'm a little short. <laughs> I'm Latoya. Um, I'm actually not from California, but I've been here a year. And when I came here a year ago, I was seven months pregnant with my daughter. And I hadn't had a clue about what hospital to go to, where to go receive care, nothing. Once I got in touch with the county of Santa Clara, the Department of Health, she was like, well, how about I enroll you in Black Infant Health and they can help you? I'm like, what is that? <laughs> when they started explaining the program and then the, the nurses started calling me, giving me different support with how to handle the end of my pregnancy. And then once I was in the hospital, the, uh, one of the ladies came and see me, one of the social workers came right to my hospital room. She said, your delivery was fine, that's great. You have a beautiful baby. We're here to help you with anything. If you need clothes, if you need transportation, the appointments, we got your back. I'm like, oh, wow. I never felt the love like this, like especially in a new place. So I was glad to be able to have a social worker, or a nurse uh, be able to call me once a month to check in with me. I participate in the, the postpartum group sessions. It's just been an amazing experience. Amazing. You have a beautiful baby. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much to Brittany and Latoya. Uh, I just want to conclude by, by offering if any of the members of the public are interested in learning more about the inequities and what you as individuals can do about them, please visit the website for our local campaign, which is called deliverbirthjustice.org. Thank you, President Wasserman. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. All right, with that, we're going to move on, Peggy, to item number six, which is public comment, which, as I stated previously, is the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on, not on today's agenda that comes under the purview of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. And with that, Peggy, if you can set the timer, please, to one minute each. And good morning. Our first speaker is R Maria Ramirez. Please accept the unmute and you will have one minute to be in speak. One minute to speak. <laughs> and Maria, can your can you mic up? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Maria. I'm one of the nurses that was working as inpatient at Valley Medical and was put on unpaid leave November 1st. I was working 40 plus hours a week frequently working overcoat and double shift. I haven't been officially terminated. I still receive communication from my unit requesting for staff to come in to help out with the short staffing. I was forced to look for work. And once my PTO and sick and educational banks were over, um, I'm being accommodated at Fancy Hospital. All I have to do is mask and test. So I don't understand why the county can't do the same for their employees. Um, I'm also in contact with recruiters from Good Sam and Regional, and they have confirmed that they're also accommodating their employees. Um, I don't see what's going on with the county. 
And I'm asking the Board of Supervisors to do what's just and fair for their employees and end this discriminatory tier system. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Nadia. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Nadia, can you accept the unmute? Hi, can you hear me? We yeah. can. Hi, good morning. My name is Nadia and I am a county employee who has been affected by the tier system that Santa Clara County implemented. I'm calling for you Board of Supervisors to interfere with this nonsense and illegal policy that has affected so many employees. Those of us who were once called heroes, I don't understand how Santa Clara County can get away with discriminating all of us based on our religious beliefs. How long will it take for you Board of Supervisors to take action and step in on this illegal matter? I think it's time for you to start showing us your support. Thank you for your time. Thank Our you. next speaker is Bren Perez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Um, hi, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, I think the rabbi could not have said it better. I mean, I'm going to go back. I hope you do too. I hope you go back and you listen. He said, because of people who allowed that to happen to them, they did nothing. He said, we must respond, act to that injustice. If you do nothing, you're supporting the mistreatment. I'm going to go back. I'm going to listen to it again. I'm going to make notes and I'm probably going to back, come back and, you know, just reiterate the discrimination against our religious beliefs like it, it needs to stop there is no justification why jeff smith's continue to push, push this agenda and you are not stopping it i just don't get it um i hope i plead you that you listen to that message from the rabbi and see how this applies to you and to us thank you our next speaker is tom davis please accept the unmute to begin speaking Tom, there you go. Oops, one more time. There we go. <clears throat> thank you for taking my time. Take, thank you for taking my call. Uh, the confusion has uh, been placed on some of the best people in the county. Some of the confusion has come from the arbitrary risk tier system used to send people home on unpaid administrative leave. I'm an air conditioning specialist. I've worked 35 years in the private sector and I've worked for the county for three and a half years. And I'm proud of the work I've done with and for the county. When I was put on unpaid leave, I asked for clarification in two written emails to Jeff Smith, Sarah Cody and James Williams on the criteria that was used to send me home from the job that I love. I received nothing except statements that I am a high risk job. Three and a half months later, roofers carpenters and middle managers were reassessed as high risk how did these jobs become more hazardous in three and a half months if the criteria was used to put that our next speaker is lori please accept the unmute to begin speaking hello and good morning can you hear me yes you can. okay hi my name is lori and i am a nurse at vmc i am unvaccinated and was granted a religious exemption on october 18th and was told i could no longer work as of november 1st because my job is high risk um two points one in just the last 18 hours 27 of my vaccinated co-workers on my unit who are either working or not comfortable public speaking have communicated with me that they have no issues working side by side with me an unvaccinated nurse being tested regularly and working and wearing appropriate PPEs. And second, I have two good friends that are also unvaccinated on leave without pay, religiously exempted and VMC County nurses. One was hired by Good Sam and is currently working and the other is also working at Stanford Hospital. I'm asking that you all end this religious discrimination order and return us to work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jill Borders. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. I'm calling specifically to discuss the homes on Scenic Vista Drive that are along the Santa Teresa Ridge Line that have now come up and over that ridge line. We they are very obvious to look at. So I lived have lived under Santa Teresa Ridge, the beautiful place making um geological amazing feature that it is only to find out that this encroachment is in, on county property so when i called my council member to say council member mayhem what the heck is going on here um, we've been protecting these forever 
I received a map and was horrified to find out that this is all county land. And so this has happened on your watch. And I'm furious. I, I mean, I'm I'm here and I stay here and I'm fighting to stay here because of those foothills. And now I look up to see these mansions on the hill looking down at me, even though I've spent 54 years fighting against that. I'm extremely disappointed. Our next speaker is Linda Edwards. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. A few weeks ago, we heard the public health director go over calculations of hypothetical people whose lives were saved because of the lockdowns and mandates implemented in our county. You had us locked down earliest, longest, and hardest of any other county in the US. So rather than concentrate on hypothetical effects of these lockdowns and mandates, let's concentrate on real numbers. For instance, how many people in our county lost their job? How many small businesses went out of business, forcing people into financial ruin? How many people are struggling with mental health challenges and depression? How many people have committed suicide? How many children fell through the cracks when schools were closed and just dropped out? Your actions had consequences. For over two years, we have been subjected to your lockdowns and mandates, which have negatively impacted our day-to-day -day lives in numerous ways. The pandemic has run its course and it is now endemic. We must learn to live with it like we do a common cold or flu. Thank you. The next speaker is Delilah Polito. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Take heed of what the rabbi stated about the Holocaust division and discrimination. We are all equal regardless of race, gender, and vaccination status. We are all human beings. The unvaccinated are being persecuted for our religious beliefs. God works in mysterious ways, and I truly believe this rabbi spoke today because it speaks to our situation. The county acts like it's inclusive and doesn't discriminate, discriminate against race, gender, religion, etc., but the county is blatantly discriminating against the unvaccinated workers. God is exposing the corrupt so-called leaders in the county. Time and time again, Jeff Smith lied to the board, to the workers, to the public. Time and time again, we made the board aware of this. Board members made statements, sent emails, a newsletter stating high-risk workers would be able to return to their jobs and that, that the county was aligning with the state. We will hold you to your word. Get rid of the discriminatory risk tier system and align with the state. If a judge presided on a case where he is racist against the defendants, do you think they will have a fair trial and a fair outcome? Well, it's clear how Jeff Smith feels about the unvaccinated workers. He discriminates against them. Next speaker is Emmett. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. And your mic is open, Emmett. If can you we, are- Can we come back to Emmett? Yeah, we'll come back. Um, our next speaker is Carlos Padilla. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, yes, um, I'm a probation counselor with uh, James Ranch. I was there 23 years of service. Um, I was put on unpaid administrative leave. I'm, I'm speaking against the um, unfair uh, tier system in our county. It doesn't line up with our state. Um, I want. I do want to go back to work. I, I was forced to turn in my pension papers because I, I wasn't getting any income. But I just. I, I want. I've given so much uh, for this county um, in the last 23 years, and I've I've only been working full time 14 years. But I was there a sports. I started the sports program. I coached these kids. I've I've I did the music program. I did their Christmas programs. I did everything I can for this county. And to be treated like I am, um, not able to go back to work and given 10 days to uh, be put on administrative leave was wrong. And I'm hoping that the Board of Supervisors can really make this right. Thank you. The next speaker is Kevin. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, can you hear me? We yes. can. Hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors. I was a protective service officer at VNC for a total of two years. During that time, I was also a training officer. Um, I left service. Of approximately two and a half months ago, and I'm trying to get my job back over there. Um, I'm going through loophole after loophole and, and roadblock after roadblock trying to get back. I do know that the department is 10 code short and super short staff. It doesn't allow the ability to have good service for the uh, staff members and the patients at VMC. I'm just asking if the board of supervisors helps, looks into this and better understand the, the idea behind uh, me not being able to have a job and trying to go back to a full code to assist with uh, the security and safety of the uh, patients and staff over there. 
Thank you. Next speaker is Ian McGuire. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning. Thank you for hearing me again. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the PSOs at BMC. You are familiar with our fight against the sheriff takeover. Just on that note, we uh, we got a people to sign a 400, 400 people to sign a petition last year, mostly from the behavioural services against the uh, SO takeover. And just last week, in a few hours, we spoke to people at the hospital, different people, and they signed uh, two or three hundred of them signed, saying that they had no confidence in the sheriff's department. We still advocate that the most vulnerable people in our community would feel much more confident and safer knowing that the PSOs were not part of law enforcement, especially with the current incumbent sheriff. And we, we, we strive to, uh, to engage with the county, but we don't think they're being serious. And we want the Board of Supervisors to uh, use their influence to, to do something about this ridiculous process. Thank you. Next speaker is Rosie Moreno. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, well, I, I know you've heard me before. I, I get on here every every time that I can. Um, again, this is in regards to the modified health orders from March 28th, which continue to affect those of us on unpaid admin leave on a made up risk tier system, which we do not know the validity or effectiveness. Um, the risk tier system has still not been provided to us as to how it was assessed, how it was created. So, you know, we're asking that the Board of Supervisors step in. Yes, you replied to our emails. Yes, we see you doing stuff, but we still do not have jobs. We serve the community. We're part of the community. Our taxpayer dollars pay for the county who does business as usual and discriminates against us. All we ask is to go back to work and wear our masks and test like everybody else does. We think Next speaker is Irvish. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you very much to the Board of Supervisors for the opportunity to speak as a public speaker. Uh, I wanted to mention about uh, the Gandhi Ashram, the Sabarmati, Sabarmati Trust and the Preservation, which is which is in the city of uh, which is in the state of Gujarat, India, the world's first, the world's biggest heritage city. And so would be the case that the Gandhi Ashram is a well-known organization which requires to sign up memorandum of understanding for the fellowship program, the first of its kind to be affiliated with the county of Santa Clara, and also to form a fellowship program where Santa Clara County and as well as uh, the Candy Ashram can both exchange the students as a part of a county program and sign a memorandum of understanding. I request Board of Supervisor to consider that, and as well as I request Board of Supervisor to consider the, uh, the signing MOU with the sports uh, inter, uh, sports uh, institution, International Cricket Association as well. Thank you very much for your consideration. Our next speaker is M. Miller. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yeah, hi, my name is Brian. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, my name is Brian. I've been an ER nurse in, uh, at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center in the ER for uh, 11 years. And just on uh, November 1st, I've been put on unpaid leave. And, uh, you know, I... Nine years ago, I ended up moving even three hours away to be able to support my wife and uh, five kids. And um, I've loved working at Valley, and I've you know I, it's worth the commute to be there. And so, because now I've been put on this unpaid leave, I've been forced to find other work. And so, another local hospital was took my religious exemption, and um, and now I'm I'm back to work. And I would really love to be able to come back to work at the county. I, it's a it's an incredible uh, place to work. I love our department and the staff and the, the patients and um, Anyways, I hope that the county can reconsider um, just this unjust tiered system and uh, let us get back to work. We were, we're willing and able and, and ready to go. So thank you for your time. The next speaker is Christina Lopez. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Christina Lopez. I work at BMC Pediatrics. I'm vaccinated and I hope you let our unvaccinated staff return to work. We've worked together side by side through the whole pandemic. Please align with California public health orders, let our nurses come back. Other hospitals allow their nurses to continue to work. The Santa Clara County shouldn't be any different. Thank you. The next speaker is Lillian Koenig. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Lillian, can you accept the unmute? 
I will come back. Uh, next speaker is Jimmy. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, uh, Board of Supervisors. I'm Jimmy Lopez. Can you guys hear me? We can. Okay. Um, I'm a nurse in the ED at Valley Medical Center. I am vaccinated and boosted. And last January, I had COVID. So I think we all run a risk working in a hospital. I think the tiered system is unfair to our unvaccinated coworkers. I believe they should be, they should come back and have the opportunity to, to work like they did prior uh, to the vaccinations. So right now we have a bunch of travelers that don't know our community, our hospital system, and we have coworkers that have 20 plus years of experience on the sidelines. And I think they should be brought back because we need them. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark LaFiguera. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Andrew, Mike Hello. is here. Hi, my name is Mark Lefiger and I'm a registered nurse at uh, VMC. I'm fully vaccinated and boosted. Yes, I feel comfortable working alongside my coworkers who are unvaccinated um, and I do not feel threatened by their choice. I miss my family, those who happen to be the missing nurses who are not allowed to come back home. This pandemic has made me question my own nursing practice, trying to decide for what I thought was excellent and compassionate care backed by scientific evidence to what I must now define for myself what is right what is truth and what I should stand for despite the barricade others are confronted with. My altruism and virtue tells me, yes, I stand by my unvaccinated coworkers. As of today, unfortunately, we have yet to welcome them back home. I respectfully remind everyone once again of Santa Clara Valley Medical Center's mission statement, which is to increase training, retention. Once again, I reiterate retention and recruitment. And furthermore, I once again respectfully remind everyone of our value, which is we respect individuals we work with. I plead with you and beg with you, please return our nurses back home. Thank you. The next speaker is Paula Maddox. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paula Maddox. I work for the probation department. I figured after two years dealing with this virus, our lives would be back to normal as it was before. Many people have followed the guidelines, got vaccinated and boosted, yet we still hear about variants and scare tactics continue to be used. When will this end? We, we were locked down and mandates were implemented. People lost their jobs, businesses suffered or went out of business, schools closed, forcing kids to be behind devices to learn from teachers. Studies sh have shown that this has not worked. People have suffered from mental health issues. Economy has suffered. Recently, Pfizer has been releasing their vaccine studies, and there are some concerns in some of those data that has been revealed each month. But yet we're still under these ridiculous mandates. Time to stop and allow people to make their own decisions on their health with their medical doctors. No more boosters or mandates. Thank you. The next speaker is telephone ending in 168. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hello. There you go. Oh, hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name's Elisa. I've been working in the BMCED for ongoing 15 years. I just wanted to express, like, we really want and need our staff back. We do have travelers. None of them are trained like we are, especially as a level one trauma center. We don't feel that the unvaccinated um, pose any greater risk and actually are safer testing twice a week and wearing PPE. I myself am vaccinated and boosted, and if I don't have symptoms, I don't test regularly. Um, so I hope you take this into consideration. Thanks for your time. The next speaker is Greg. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hello, my name is Greg Phillips. I work in the Valley Medical Center ER uh, for 17 years now, and I also am vaccinated and want my coworkers to come back to work. I am not afraid of having them be there. Uh, I have lost my father to COVID. It has personally touched me and I am needing my coworkers who are unvaccinated to be allowed to work to help support our safety system that is being depleted. And we are not serving as well as we can. Uh, the vaccines do not stop us from spreading disease. I also have uh, contracted COVID in January despite being vaccinated and infected my entire family who is also vaccinated. So the vaccines are not helping. So please let our coworkers come back. Do not discriminate based on their 
religious and personal beliefs. We need them back. Thank you. The next speaker is A.H. Please accept me and speaking. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. My name is Andrew Hardy. I'm a registered nurse in the uh, ER at Valley Medical Center for over 18 years. Um, I've been on unpaid leave um, with the county also since November 1st. And I really appreciate the recent uh, conversations that some of the board of supervisors have been involved in and their assistance with RMPA. And I just wanted to uh, continue to express um, my grateful, I'm really grateful that you guys are inquiring and advocating for us. And it's not just the nurses, there are a lot of people that are all on leave um, that are considered high risk with this tier system that have absolutely no contact with the public at all. So we're really wanting some transparency with this. And I also am one of the nurses that have gotten a job at a local hospital with my religious exemption and am working currently. The next speaker is Christina. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, my name's Christina. Um, I'm also a year nurse at VMC. I've been working there for over 10 years. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time to hear us out. Um, I just want to say please support all the investing nurses with the religious exemptions and, and just question this tier system and, and how, how, you know, how it makes all sense when we're all serving the same population. We're lost at ex of many years of experienced nurses and other frontline workers of the community. We all supported you and please allow, you know, the nurses and other healthcare workers um, with exemptions to work. Set an example locally and nationally. Don't go into the peer pressure. Question the facts and the validity of the tier system. Question Jeff Smith and Sarah Cody. We just want to work. We want to serve our community. We've made it through the pandemic. So just let us resume our lives and honor and respect the religious exemptions. This is your time, Board of Supervisors, to step up and really support us. And um, thank you so much for taking the time to hear us. Next speaker is Ruth Cervantes. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, my name is Ruth Cervantes and I'm also an ER nurse. I am vaccinated and boosted and I support my unvaccinated coworkers um, who have many, many years of experience and I have learned from them. We are currently missing them in the front lines and the community needs them. We all need them. We have many travel nurses that are very unexperienced taking care of our community. And it shows in our wait times, it shows in our acuity levels and we need to support them. Thank you. Going back to Emmett, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Yes. All right. So I'd like to say everyone had a choice to be vaccinated and they made that choice. I would like to ask in what respect to COVID is equality being measured? Unvaccinated citizens of Santa Clara County can enter public shared airspace that others cannot. Firefighters, policemen, first responders, and citizens of Santa Clara all have a choice to be vaccinated but not county workers. Again, in what respect to COVID is equality being measured? Thanks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And going back to Lillian Koenig, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Lillian, can you, ex let me, she's got two names, one moment. Thank you, Peggy. Can you hear me? Yes, your mic is now yes. open. I, I am so sorry. I couldn't figure out how to get the unmute down. I needed a, a, a description of how to do that. Anyway, um, I'm uh, speaking to Otto Lee. Uh, I live in uh, District 3. And with the uh, Gunderson High School shooting, I would like you to take it upon yourself. Um, as the rabbi stated, absence of action leadership. Please, instead of spending $3 million of the county money, to the Gilroy uh, Fund for that particular shooting, let us take action and avoid these kind of shootings. I was in schools as a sub for 10 years, and it is a scary place to be these days. We don't have enough protection as teachers in classrooms and high schools. 
and in uh, various other schools. Um, we need a little bit of leadership with gun control. And if you don't recognize this, I don't know when we will. As the rabbi said, inspire, absence of action, violence, all of these things need to be taken into account. The next speaker is Teresa. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Teresa, can you, ex there you go. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm just calling again to, um, to ask the board to please reconsider the decisions that have been made regarding um, sending employees on unpaid leave for not getting vaccinated. Um, I, I am concerned with um, the, the um, deliberate, um, oh my gosh, I wanna express myself. They um, about not honoring Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act and just blatantly not honoring people invoking their right to religious exemption. And that is alarming to me. And I'm looking at the verbiage of the letters about legal about the ordinances being legal documents and people not being not stating their um, legal right to the exemption when the exemption in itself is their right. And I, I am very concerned about that. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you, Peggy. Nice job as always. I would like to let all the speakers know that are still with us that Dr. Jeff Smith under item 21 will be addressing, addressing this issue. As far as any updates or new information, he will be providing that under item 21. And item 21 is not as far away as it may sound because we have about 10 items between this item and item 21 that will be going on the consent calendar. So if you want to hear updated information and a response to what most of the speakers expressed today, I suggest you stay on and hear item 21. Thank you. We now move on to item number seven, which is approval of the consent calendar and changes to the Board of Supervisors. And Peggy, if you've caught your breath and wet your whistle, if you will, re if you will please uh, read the consent calendar and changes as it stands now. I have done both and here we go. Request from Supervisor Chavez to add item number 10 to the consent calendar. Item number 10 is to consider recommendations relating to improving the security and safety of county funded permanent supportive housing facilities. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item number 13 to the consent calendar. Item number 13 is to approve county sponsorship of Berryessa Business Association and Bay Area Community Development Services in the amount of $1,000 from the Supervisorial District 3 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board fiscal year 2021-2022 budget to support the annual Berryessa Art and Wine Festival. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee to add item numbers 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 to the consent calendar. <clears throat> Item number 14 is to approve county sponsorship of the Boy Scouts of America, Silicon Valley, Monterey Bay Council in the amount of $2,000 from the Supervisorial District 2 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board, fiscal year 2021-2022 budget to support the scout Rama Festival. We, uh, item number 15 is to approve county sponsorship of the Healthier Kids Foundation in the amount of $2,000 from the Supervisorial District 2 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board fiscal year 2021-2022 budget to support the Symposium of Children's Health. Item number 16 is to approve county sponsorship of the Healthier Kids Foundation in the amount of $3,000 from the Supervisorial District 4 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board fiscal year 2021-2022 budget to support the at a glance status of Children's Health Symposium. Item number 17 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsorship for Valley Medical Center Foundation. Item number 18 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsoring Valley Medical Center Foundation's Live with Chris Wilder event. 
Item number 19 is to approve county sponsorship of Avenidas in the amount of $1,000 from the Supervisorial District 5 allocation in the Office of the Clerk of the Board fiscal year 2021-2022 budget to support the 2022 Lifetimes of Achievement Awards. Item number 20 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsoring the United Nations Association Film Festival documentary, Youth vs. Gov screening. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item number 24 to the consent calendar. Item number 24 is to approve grant agreement with School of Arts and Culture relating to funding for pre-development activities associated with acquiring and redeveloping the property opposite to the Mexican Heritage Plaza located in the Mayfair neighborhood of East San Jose in an amount not to exceed $250,000 for period April 5, 2022 through February 1, 2023. We have a request from administration to hold item numbers 26 and 27 to April 19, 2022. Item number 26 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 189 in the amount of $890,122, increasing revenues and expenditures in the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Hospital Clinics budget relating to augmentation of revenue cycle staff. Item number 27 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.80, adding various positions in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. We have a request from administration to hold item number 28 to May 3, 2022. Item number 28 is to receive report relating to options for implementing microenterprise home kitchen operations. And we have a request from the clerk of the board to hold item number 31B to April 19, 2022. Item number 31B is to approve minutes of the March 22, 2022 regular meeting. And that concludes the consent calendar update. Thank you, Peggy. Very nice job. Thank you all for the additions to the consent. I'm not crazy about the holds, but I know there's reasons. And with that said, I will turn to supervisors for a motion or comments. So moved. Thank you. A motion by Supervisor Lee for approval as stated is my assumption. Yes. Do I have a second? I have some comments, President Wasserman. Sure, we'll have those. We need a second and we'll After. open it up for discussion. Second. Second by Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, you're first, then Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to keep item 10 on the regular agenda, please, so I can get a few clarifications on the process and uh, request some friendly amendments in support of that work. Right. Uh, with regard to item 40, I would uh, happy to keep it on consent, but I just want to offer congratulations to the Burn Center on receiving a Center of Excellence status and, and just take a quick moment of personal privilege to acknowledge the doctors and nurses and other medical and, and hospital personnel that work in this unit. Uh, unfortunately, our administration and the VPG are experiencing some strains in the relationship right now. But over the past several months, many dozens of doctors uh, have emailed me sharing their stories and how they came to work at VMC. And I was really struck by the number of them who came through training at UPMC in Western Pennsylvania, where my dad was the director of the Regional Burn Trauma Center and the founder of a local mm -hmm. burn camp. Uh, my dad, uh, late dad, uh, Dr. Harvey Slater, also directed the residency program for decades, and it really touched my heart that more than a few of our physicians uh, recognized his name. Uh, ultimately, we are all connected. Burn injuries are some of the most horrific physical traumas a person can experience, and I am so proud that our county boasts a center of excellence where survivors know they will get the very best care and every opportunity to be supported in their recovery and their reintegration into their families and communities. Congratulations again, and thank you to the doctors, nurses, and all personnel that care for these very vulnerable patients. Uh, with regard to item 41, uh, I wanna make a quick comment as well. Uh, first, a, a thank you very much to staff uh, for the Trust Mobile Response Semi-Annual Report. I'd like to see either in a future, e either in a future semi-annual report or off agenda, the evaluation plan for Trust once the contracted evaluator has been selected and has completed their plan. I think this will be helpful for the board to monitor outcomes and potential for expansion. So I would add that direction to the 
uh, motion to approve the consent calendar as well as keeping 10 on the regular calendar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Um, items uh, 57, 58, and 59 have to do with the county response uh, to the v VTA May 26th mass shooting. Items 58 and 59 are also a response to my referral from August of last year. And I'd like to keep these, item on these items on consent with some additions. First, I, I do really wanna share a sincere thank you to the Office of the District Attorney, the administration, and the county departments and partners who provided much needed services to VTA's employees. And I would also like to thank my colleagues for their support. There are several outstanding items relating to the referral and the motion that I made. In particular, I asked for stakeholder engagement plan to come to the board to inform the county's overall trauma recovery center. And I am, um, second, I'm um, interested in understanding the funding for the center. Staff's October 19th op agenda memo indicated there would be part of the, the um, budget. Um, so I would like to request a report from the, on the board's first meeting in May to the staff's vision for the recovery center, the service gaps that we're addressing, the stakeholder engagement plan, and the um, funding for that. As I'm presuming that's part of the budget, but if it's not, I wanna better understand the funding streams. Um, item 40, 41, um, which Supervisor Ellenberg commented on, um, and that is the, or maybe let me just make sure I'm right about that item number. This is the, um, the trust response urgent support uh, team. I, I wanna reinforce what Supervisor Ellenberg raised about making sure that we have the evaluation component very clearly um, thought out and funded. And the other just for staff is that I am very concerned about having, uh, as I've stated a number of times about having more too many phone numbers for people to call. And I'm, I just, um, and I know Supervisor Wasserman has played a leadership role on our um, county comms team. And I, I don't know the very best way for us to do evaluation or to properly um, determine who responds to what kind of emergency if people are given a bunch of different phone numbers and they have to figure that out for themselves. I'm actually even concerned about it with the um, MCAT team that we have now. Um, because it's a little confusing when people call, they then get sent to another number if it's not the right fit. And I, I just want to raise that for colleagues because I, I, I'm pretty nervous about that as we as we proceed. Um, and then lastly, colleagues, um, I think uh, if I could, I just wanted to confirm that um, item twelve, the data privacy and security policy update, is that on the agenda still? Yes, that is on the agenda. Great, thank you. I am looking forward to supporting it. I just had a question or two for Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Well, that's not my dog. That's all I can say. That was okay. support for item number 12, Mr. Chairman. I I, uh, I understood it quite clearly. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. All right, we have a motion, we have a second, we have a little bit of direction. Um, but uh, Supervisor Simidian, you've got a question. And Supervisor Lee, you were okay with the direction that was given? Yes. Thank and you. Go ahead, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to confirm that as things now stand, and I know we're going to hear from folks in the public, um, the consent calendar update is distributed with the uh, 9.30 a.m. Uh, timestamp for this morning. It, it stands as uh, presented, yes? Except for item number 10. Thank you. And uh, uh, that was the part that I wanted to make sure I understood clearly. And uh, I'd also like to be an abstention on item number 49, please, or nine. Okay. That is, Thanks so much. That is duly noted. We have a motion. We have a second. We have some additional direction that was given in with given by the seconder and agreed to by the motion maker. And we have the abstention on 49 and 10 is put back on, but otherwise the agenda reads as follows. I will ask for a roll call vote, please, Peggy. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. 
and President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you very much. We now move on to item number eight, which is a public hearing that was not to be heard any sooner than 10 a.m. It is now 10.30, so we are going to hear it. I am going to open the public hearing and receive any testimony from any individuals that wish to speak. Peggy, I do not see any registered individuals for this item. Do you concur? I agree. Thank you. I'm going to close the public hearing. I'll turn to Supervisor Simonian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, um, you know, really a, a, a moment of uh, great satisfaction here. So I'm going to move approval of the staff recommendation and say thanks to uh, all of the folks on the team who made this happen. I will second that. Thank you very much. All right. We don't have any speakers. I see no other hands. Peggy, I've opened. I've closed. Will you please, we have a motion for the adoption and approval. Is that correct, Supervisor Smithian? It is. Thank you. And I seconded that. Roll call vote, please, on item eight. Peggy? Supervisor V? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smithian? Aye. Vice President Ellerberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. With that, it is my pleasure to move to item number nine, which is the approval of a referral. Um, you all have it before you, but bottom line is to create a fourth assessment appeals board. And I think the brief description is self-explanatory. It's a couple of pages. County assessor is here to answer any questions, if there are any. Peggy, I don't see any members of the public looking to speak. Do you agree? I do. Oh, actually, we do have one raised hand now. Okay, thank you. Will you please give that individual two minutes? Our next speaker is Jill Borders. One moment. Please thank accept you. the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you. Um, you said it seemed uh, obvious what this item was about, and I'm, I'm sorry, could you actually make it a little more clear what the item is about? Because it's not obvious to me, and I'm very concerned with what's happening with uh, land in general in um, San Jose, and obviously now I have to be concerned with county land as well. Thank you. Sure, the short summary, uh, it's available online as well, but it's creating a fourth assessment appeals board, which would have three individuals on it instead of our current system that basically has one. Um, it's uh, currently an assessment hearing officer. This creation of a fourth one We'll have three individuals on it. And odds are when you have three individuals that are trained and intelligent and educated um, in the assessment area of properties, especially large values, you're more likely to get to a more sound decision as compared to having one individual. That's the process. Assessor Stone, um, you're there. Thank you very much for being here today. Is there anything you'd like to add, please? Uh, no, just that we support uh, your referral to create one additional assessment appeals board to specialize in the adjudication of legal appeals and to dis discontinue the two legal assessment hearing officer positions. Uh, it reduces the risk uh, and it and you know because uh, we would we have been advised by the county council that the existing uh, two individual uh, uh, hearing officers, legal hearing officers, can only adjudicate uh, situations of five hundred thousand dollars or less. Now, back no. when I first became the assessor twenty-seven years ago, that was a reasonable number. Well, today it's not. So I think this is this is the right thing to do. Uh, it's it's best for the public and it's also best for the county. Yeah, Thank will you. help definitely help expedite things and. Certainly most things in Santa Clara County have an assessed value in excess of 500,000. Thank you. I don't see any other speakers, Peggy, do you? No, I do not. Thank you. Supervisor Simidian, um, I'll certainly make the motion to approve my referral and uh, look for a second and Supervisor Simidian, your comments. You're muted, sir. Sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I sure. just wanted to uh, ask that uh, when the motion is seconded, uh, it uh, incorporate as well, if you're amenable, direction to staff to look at other uh, procedural improvements that might be made to make this system uh, more robust. Uh, pro I, I think you've got one 
uh, notion here uh, that uh, I know you're optimistic will improve the situation, but I think there may be other procedural things what that we could do. So we could just uh, broaden the, the referral a little bit. And then I just wanted to be clear based on the uh, request from the speaker, I uh, from the public uh, commenter, I um, this is a referral asking for options. So this is not a direction to actually take this step quite yet. Did I get that right, Mr. Chair? A referral is that um, it's for the appropriate administrative staff to come back with what we need to vote on that's legally applicable through county council to create a fourth assessment appeals board. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking, Mr. Chair, and I, I want to support the motion and expect to here in a moment, but uh, it, it specifically says under recommended action that the referral is uh, to administration and county council to report to the board with Gosh. options for analysis and options for creating a fourth assessment appeals board. So I just, I, I, I think uh, you're wise to have framed it that way. I think it gives the staff and county council the opportunity to weigh in with some possibilities. Yep. Um, but I, I take your bottom line notion here, which is we need some more folks on the job who have the right set of skills. And that leads me then finally to a question, which is um, in hearing from the assessor, there was reference to eliminating something. Is it your expectation that by the referral we are eliminating? No, I think what has to happen is a concurrent um, where the new, the new, the fourth board is created at which time the other two is no, are no longer necessary. So I think that's to come back in options from administration to right. us when they bring the referral back. I'm hoping um, that they go in this direction and I'm entirely open to them coming back with other thoughts and suggestions, whatever it takes to continue to improve our system. All right, well, thank you. That, that uh, response to my questions uh, and thank you to both you and the assessor for trying to uh, make sure the system uh, is functional and responsive. Thank you, and also current with the times. As was mentioned, the $500,000 limitation, back when I bought my house for 220,000, that certainly covered most things. And um, it no longer does cover most things in Santa Clara County. So Supervisor Submitting, with that uh, direction and inquiry, are you a second? I'll be a second, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other comments? We have no other speakers. If not, Peggy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you all very much. With that, we're moving on to item number 10. And I think what I'm going to do, since it was Vice President Ellenberg, um, that had some questions and didn't want it to go on consent. Vice President, your hand's not raised, but I think I'll turn right to you for, thank your, you. for your comments. Terrific, thank you so much. I wanna thank uh, Supervisors Chavez and Lee, as well as the Sheriff's Office for uh, digging into how we might improve security at Renaissance Place. I, I believe this is uh, one of the very first Measure A permanent supportive housing sites that provides opportunities for our chronically unhoused community members, as well as those uh, with disabilities, um, the, the oppor opportunities for them to improve their circumstances. Uh, and I have learned through, through this referral and, and other sources that the site has faced a number of challenges since opening its doors. Uh, I agree with my colleagues that it is critical that our permanent supportive housing facilities are in fact supportive and safe environments. I just, I pulled the item from consent because I have um, a few questions about the recommendation regarding the security assessment report. Uh, since I understand that the referral may be seeking um, to set a precedent or a standard for similar uh, hardening processes for all other supportive housing locations. Uh, the two bolded recommendations for immediate action were uh, first, the creation of a set of corrective measures for low to moderate violations of house rules, and two, the creation of a set of post orders for private security at the facility. So regarding the first of these recommendations, um, 
it, it's just not clear to me how the proposed corrective measures for low to moderate violations of house rules would result in greater safety. I'm, I'm of course concerned, and I'm, I'm sure you are too, that punishing people who are in dire need of housing and maybe having a hard time adjusting to a new environment may, pretend, may in some ways defeat our underlying goal of housing first. Regarding the second, um, I believe that the, the job of, of hardening the sites to the extent that an assessment study reveals to be necessary could be undertaken either by the CEO's office as suggested or by the contracted security company that the county has already hired, uh, perhaps even assisted by, uh, by SJPD. I, I want to note also that the, the priority recommendations that are highlighted in the conclusion of the report may not be entirely consistent, uh, or my read, perhaps my reading is faulty, but may not be entirely consistent with recommendations made throughout the report, which really focus on that hardening through capital improvement. I absolutely support an emphasis on capital improvements that are deemed to be beneficial to enhance security. Uh, and I would like the, I, I would ask the maker and the seconder of the motion, uh, if you would consider a, a, a few additions uh, to add some direction to the administration to consider what other preventative uh, rather than punitive steps we can take, such as improving and expanding substance use disorder treatment and enhancing other on-site support services. Second, uh, one of the elements of the referral seeks budget for additional staffing to the CEO's facility security unit to assess and implement changes across supportive housing sites. And, and here I would, I would ask for a friendly um, amendment to the motion to not immediately authorize ongoing funding for an expanded role of, of county facility security, though I do support funding for an assessment study until the report comes back to the board with a clarification of what role that county facility security plays with regard to ensuring or providing security at permanent supportive housing sites versus the role of the local PD, uh, private security companies, property managers, uh, the Office of Supportive Housing, and, and even the planning department. Uh, next, and I'm happy to summarize them again, I just want to put everything out at once. Um, I'd like to ask for the by um, facility security and um, and the uh, Office of Supportive Housing and for consideration of additional staffing to be addressed in the report back. And Vice President, just so you're aware, your live video has disappeared. We lost your voice for about three seconds, but now you're back strong. Oh, no. And now, right. you're, now you're live again and we can hear you. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure, so I'll just back up with, with one request. I'd like the report in part C to be produced in partnership by facility security and Office of Supportive Housing and for consideration of additional staffing to be addressed in the report back. And the final request is that security standards and options for consideration in parts A and C of the referral be developed in partnership with the Office of Supportive Housing and conclude and include a detailed consideration of support services that are successful, uh, ones that are missing or currently being provided and need improvement to support the safety of the residents and the neighboring community. So I will pause and breathe and see if um, Thank you. those were clear, if I need to do it slowly yeah. or if they all okay, sound so okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Supervisor. Supervisor yeah. Chavez, let me back this up for just a second. So, Supervisor Chavez, for the record, are you the motion maker and Supervisor Lee the seconder or vice yes. versa? Okay. So oh, I jumped ahead a little bit. I figured oh, that was. That's okay. <laughs> I know Mike, Mike went to you before I had a chance to frame up the discussion. Yes. Thank you. So, okay. We have the motion by Chavez, the second by Lee. We have the comments by Ellenberg. Now I turn to the motion maker for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, colleagues, that just to share that um, much of what is before you is uh, not uh, is driven by both the folks who 
work at the facilities and people who live at the facilities. So nothing is happening to people. We're having conversations with them already. I want to be very clear about that. Um, second, um, the report that um, Supervisor Allenberg is referring to is a confidential report and is not in the document. So I, I, I know some people may have been looking for that. Um, one of the reports that you're referring to. Um, and what I would say just overall is that um, there is a lot of work that has already gone on between um, um, all of our staff to get them even to communicate um, more effectively. So this, the, the broad arching goal here, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, is actually to get the staffs um, to, um, but to be able to start to have a plan and work more deftly together to be able to be responsive to needs. And so as an example, with the, with the main um, location we're talking about, um, dosage and investment in services is already a process that's going on there. And, um, and so, and, and to be, Oh, Susan, you just left us. Are you still there? I'm, I'm still here and okay. I have no idea what keeps happening. Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't lose you. So you didn't lose me. I'm I'm here. And maybe yeah. somebody from TSS could come help me, please. So what I um what I would recommend is that um the the recommendations that you're making or the I, I would actually want to give those to staff as simply that supervisor Ellenberg as recommendations because there really is a lot of work that's already moving forward on this uh, on this body of work. And one of the most important really um, to dive into uh, kind of whose responsibility what is is my right. intent is that this the outcome of these deeper discussions will lead us to those outcomes. So I, I think that's that was intended. I'm sorry it wasn't explicit. Some of the other issues that you raise about, um, you know, obviously our percentage of keeping people housed is remarkably high, yeah. um, and so we don't want to we don't want to negatively impact that. And yet, in some of our facilities, we have persons who are, um, because we have a housing first model, um, are are not are are somewhat service resistant. So what rather than give. Sure the specific direction you're recommending, I'd rather give that again, all of it as staff, please consider these options. The one issue that you raised about having the staff come back before there would be an expand, expanded investment in security, I'm mm -hmm. fine with that because I think that's a budget action anyway. Um, but I do wanna emphasize to the staff that, that my objective is to make sure that the facilities are safe for the people who live there for the people who work there and for the surrounding neighborhoods. So I, that's still gonna, that, that hasn't, that's not changed for me at all in this. And I think we, we have to be able to, to use all the tools at our, um, that we have before us. And frankly, the tools we're not using. So, so Supervisor Ellenberg, you were so detailed and I'm sorry, I didn't get every note of everything you said. And so, and I know that it's hard because with the Brown Act that we can only talk to two people. Right. Like I'm I, not, like I really appreciate that. But if the staff could receive your comments and consider them as options, the, the one that I want to accept out of the box is no growth without the, you know, without a budget discussion. I think that's totally appropriate. Thank you. And what about the, um, <laughs> do, do you mind if I, and I really appreciate that. Um, if I kind of do it more slowly and we can. I'm, I'm not in the, the each challenge one. supervisor Ellenberg is there's work going on in each of the areas that you're discussing right. that's already happening. And so what the reason I would like to give staff your document is they can, they can respond to it. I don't have any problem with that, but sure. I do not want to be directive because work is already in prog progress and I don't want to stop that. I do want to make sure that, you know, that the board gets, um, gets more, information as they proceed. And so what I'd like to do is treat that as a as additional feedback, but not additional direction. Let me share um, that my my priority around safety is is absolutely the same as yours. Um, and I appreciate the the hold off on the budget until we understand whose role and what the ongoing needs are. And that's fine. Um, the other piece that 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 I would say of all of the 
the bits of input is really to make sure that um, that our Office of Supportive Housing is part of this work within the, the CEO's office. And, and perhaps they already are, and that just wasn't they are. clear yeah. to me. Yes, thank you for that. And I'm really sorry that wasn't clear okay. because that is absolutely the intent. Okay. And as a matter of fact, super. Yeah, anyway, but that, okay. that's absolutely. Thank you so much. Then I am, I'm going to be very glad to support the motion with the one directed change, and I will send a memo. Um, uh, to whoever the appropriate person is to send a memo. Well, and I, what that. I would request is that if that could just get sent to the whole board and of course. to the executive, and that way, as I'm following this, I can make sure I'm tracking what we're doing. So thank you for that. Thank Super you. Much. And James, is there any issue with my doing that? James, question from the vice president. Just to send to the whole board. What's already public record? Yeah, I would imagine. Okay. Yeah. No. Thank fine. you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Good legal thank you for bringing the referral forward. It's really strong. I appreciate that. And we're all in favor of increased safety. We've got a motion, we've got a second. Vice President Ellenberg's on board, I'm on board. We have Supervisor Lee, the seconder, the co-author. Sir, yes. go, go ahead. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, President Wasserman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Chavez for uh, writing and uh, this uh, important referral and allowing me to join you on this. I've also spoken with uh, other council members and cities uh, and also current residents living in these housing who have expressed concerns about the issue of these security. Um, as a key partner in the permanent supportive housing er uh, arena, the county clearly has a responsibility to keep up with the safety concerns of the residents and the neighborhoods surrounding them. This referral seeks to establish these minimum security standards at these units, which hopefully will also provide some peace of mind to the residents and the neighbors alike. The referral also will look into increasing the budget and staffing for the facility security unit in the county executive's office, which consists currently only of one person. While one director of facility security is doing a good job, he has responsibility to provide security support for all of the dozen county facilities across the county. And we really need to provide uh, the facility security unit with the resources it needs to protect our facilities. The Supportive Housing Institute has been helpful in providing consistent baseline for those who served up permanent supportive housing clients. With this referral, we'll be able to hopefully be able to sustain this program into the next fiscal year to train more individuals in supporting our clients. And we understand that for some individuals, this transition into the permanent supportive housing may be quite an adjustment and that they may need additional support since our environment is so different. We look forward to the administration's report back with information on the standardization of these security measures and other uh, supportive housing facilities that can implement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peggy, vote please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Yes. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. With that, we move on to item 11 from Supervisor Simidian and Lee, the creation of a Valley Health Center located in the West Valley. Supervisor Simonian. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Um, uh, I wanna make sure because I think they were posted to our agenda relatively late that colleagues are aware of the letters of support, which I very much appreciate from uh, either the official uh, body or elected officials uh, writing independently from uh, the city of Cupertino, town of Los Gatos, city of Montesarino, city of Saratoga, and city of Sunnyvale. Thank you to them all, as well as folks at Sunnyvale Elementary, Cupertino Elementary, and perhaps most uh, directly, uh, the folks at Foothill De Anza who have sent their formal uh, letter of support for this initiative. Uh, colleagues, I'm sure will remember that um, back in October, uh, I asked our board to I provide some direction to the administration uh, for uh, uh, an effort to find a, a clinic site uh, somewhere in the North County or West Valley. Uh, staff jumped right on it. Thank you to them as well. Uh, they've identified a couple of possibilities in the North County area. Uh, but uh, here to give credit where credit is due, as that conversation was taking place, uh, Patrick Ahrens, the president of the Foothill De Anza Community College Board, reached out and said, hey, what about the De Anza site? And uh, his 
thinking, which I, you know, had one of those of course moments on was um, they are in the process of redesigning their site. Some of you know that the Flint Center is uh, going to go under the bulldozer uh, for better or worse. And uh, that means there's an opportunity here to be in literally no pun intended on the ground floor uh, and redesigning um, uh, what happens there. And uh, that redesign could, of course, include a health clinic. Uh, I reached out uh, based on uh, Patrick's uh, inquiry to talk with our own county staff. They said, you know, that has real possibilities. Talk, talk to Dr. Smith, I talked to uh, Mr. Lorenz. Uh, to their credit, uh, we immediately pulled together then a conversation with uh, Judy Minor, the chancellor at the uh, Foothill De Anza, and her team, along with Dr. Smith, to explore the possibilities. And I think the short version here, and I know you like that, Mr. Chairman, is uh, there's a tremendous potential and a real need uh, and real enthusiasm. And that is a nice combination. I want to thank Supervisor uh, Lee, who jumped right on this one as well. Uh, he is our co-author, and not only are the, is there an opportunity to do all kinds of good things with this site, but it has the potential to reduce really an extraordinary amount of pressure uh, at Sunnyvale where uh, that facility is overburdened. So with that, I'll offer a motion and uh, ask my uh, colleague, Supervisor Lee, if I may through the chair for a second. Supervisor Lee. Yes, happy to second, and I actually do have a uh... Uh, a question to uh, a, propo a proposed uh, uh, question to ask the maker is to also seek uh, to see if you'd be interested to also add the potential of the behavioral health services so that this might not only provide the services but also may provide pro uh, mental health training opportunities for the students at, uh, at the end of the end as well. I had, I had meant that to be implicit, Mr. Chair, but I'm happy to incorporate it. I think Supervisor Lee is wise to make sure that we call it out so that uh, people know that that is a part of the referral. So I'm happy to incorporate that with Supervisor Lee's uh, concurrence. And, and I should also mention, uh, it occurs to me that, you know, this is a referral. There are lots of different ways we could uh, come up with a good result that might include uh, working with, partnering with some of our community clinics as well uh, to provide some of these services. So with that, I'll, I'll say uh, yes uh, to the specific call out on mental health services, which uh, I think is uh, important. Thank you. So the maker and the seconder of their motion really like this referral. And it is not direction, but it is a referral for staff to come back. I am elated to see De Anza step forward and say, let's partner and here's our land to uh, be part of that, that partnership instead of us going to look for land and the accessibility and the parking and everything. I, kudos to everybody and thank you to De Anza for stepping forward. Um, great, great idea. Vice President Ellenberg, you had something? I, yes, just um, to, to build on what, um, what Supervisor Lee just mentioned about uh, student opportunities. I am particularly interested in opportunities for workforce development and health careers that might develop from this partnership. So I would love if any uh, recommendations, uh, I would love to hear any recommendations from administration on this aspect of the proposal in future updates uh, to the board and consideration of any possible uh, replicability with other area uh, higher education institutions as we look at the need for nurses and behavioral health workers, community outreach staff, uh, and others. I think we can use this opportunity uh, to address multiple issues. So I'm, I'm very supportive of it and, and thank you. And I hope that you'll include a direction for administration to talk about workforce and look for those opportunities as well. Through the chair, if I may, that is yeah. referenced in the body of the referral, but uh, to Supervisor Ellenberg's point, it is not referenced in the recommended action language. So with the concurrence of Supervisor Lee, I am happy to uh, provide that direction explicitly again uh, in the uh, recommended action. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, I, I think this is a wonderful um, thoughtful approach. And I, I particularly like the, 
the opportunity to share resources in such a thoughtful way. Um, two recommendations that I would like to make um, for staff is that one, I think there would be a lot of value in having um, a conversation with BTA about the transportation services and perhaps the proximity of where they provide services to the to the clinic so that uh, so anyway that's just a period only because I want them you know that that's an important um, uh, bus stop and bus um, hub there and I think that could be helpful in terms of design and folks both on campus and off campus being able to access the facility um, and the supervisor submit in any thoughts about that uh, happy to incorporate that direction as well with the concurrence of the seconder. Um, and I, to just to underscore your point through the chair, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that makes this so appealing is the location and proximity, both to highways, but also critically important to public transportation. So mm -hmm. happy to include that as a specific direction through the chair. Thank you. <laughs> And then one one other area I just wanted to touch on, um, you know, for those of you, if you, I know everybody's been out to see the VASC um, already, the Vietnamese American Service Center, but one of the things that's really interesting to me about the the facility is the design in terms of the um, the you know like there's one part of the floor that when you go to get services it doesn't say mental health or OBGYN or dental it's very um welcoming and not stigmatizing and all of that and um and i think the integration of the types of services that to your point supervisor submitting and include both um county services but then the non you know nonprofit services and other services that can be embedded in there I, I actually am very interested from knowing from staff as to whether or not the, you know, one, how that model's working, two, how do we measure if that model's working, and then three, does it impact future design for buildings like this? What's so interesting, um, Supervisors Samidian and Lee, what's interesting to me about this is it both reminds me of the VASC relative to the mental, you know, like to what I just said about integration, but also at San Jose State, the you know Martin Luther King Jr. Library is a is a partnership between the county I'm sorry the the university and the city of San Jose and it's it's a really incredibly well done integrated uh, site and you wouldn't know whose library what part of the library you're in to touch what part of the service so in any case I I think we've got some good design uh, operational models that I hope the staff also will take a look at so thank you this is very very exciting. All right, I think we're all very excited to approve this referral. Are we there or is there more? Supervisor Lee, your hand is up. Sure, just uh, real quick, um, just as the referral stated, there are over 43,000 Medicare recipients and over 40,000 people who receive other public benefits in the West Valley communities. Yes. That really needs a local county health clinic. And for the residents of West Valley, the closest location right now is the Valley Health Center in Sunnyvale. Right, which has a huge demand. And so this new county on the ends of campus is absolutely important to continue building our county's role and providing these services that for those who need it most. Uh, so in addition, as we mentioned earlier, I believe it's already included, the request administration want to make it clear is to explore the options of adding behavior health services and providing mental health training opportunities for the Foothill and the ends of college students as a core component of this new clinic. And at the end of the day, just like uh, Supervisor uh, Chavez has mentioned, how we could integrate the servicing uh, and reducing the stigma relating to mental health uh, to build the mental health workforce that we desperately need right here in the county, and especially in the West Valley, then including these mental health services, of course, will be a crucial step in addressing these issues of this mental health crisis we have right here in our county. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. And Peggy, we have one speaker. Let's let that speaker in, and then we'll take a vote. One moment. Our next speaker is Dolores Alvarado. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good, good morning, everyone, Board of Supervisors, and thank you all for this great support of um, Supervisor Simidi and Supervisor Lee's proposal regarding the De Anza College uh, potential site, clinic site. We um, were very much in support of this, and a couple of reasons. One is the possibility of integrated behavioral health with Valley Medical Center using a similar model as the one that 
uh, has now been developed in Mountain View with Planned Parenthood and specialty care. The other is um, from a CHP proper perspective, the idea of having a site where our AHEC students, these are students that are considering careers in healthcare, not just behavioral health, but medical, other medical, MA, medical, you know, doctor, nurse, et cetera, would be a great training site. Most of our students do come from community colleges, so it would be a great opportunity to have that partnership. And I'm um, calling to ask um, to have that conversation uh, when the time is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. All right, let's take the 5-0 vote that I think is coming on this referral. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Oman. <clears throat> yes. And President Wasserman. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just messing with you, Supervisor Smitty. All right. That was item number 11. My intent with what we have remaining is not to break for lunch and be done by one. Let's see how close we can come to that. Item number 12 is a approving a referral from Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Uh, this item, colleagues, uh, is really boring, but really important. So uh, I want to see if I can engage you a little bit more by pointing out that our existing uh, technology and privacy ordinance was uh, actually very cutting edge, I'm sure, back in 1979 when it was introduced and adopted. In um, the last 43 years, uh, the world has changed more than a little, of course. And just to put it in context, uh, 43 years ago, 1979, Jimmy Carter was president. Disco was very big. Uh, millions of Americans were watching uh, Dallas and Knott's Landing and Vegas. Uh, and uh, just to make sure I pull Mr. Wasserman in, I will remind him that that was the last time the Pittsburgh Pirates won a World Series. So uh, yeah, I, I see that I have another fan there. Thank so you. I bought, a, all, I bought a T top Camaro in 1979. There you go. So uh, all of which, uh, you know, not to not to be frivolous here, but it, I mean, this was a really forward looking uh, notion back in 1979, but it has literally not been amended in the intervening four plus decades. Right. So what we're asking for here is a 21st century upgrade. Uh, you know, the world has changed a lot, uh, both in terms of technology and regulation in the intervening decades, everything from HIPAA to the data breach law to our own surveillance ordinance, uh, the chief privacy officer and a privacy office here at the county. Uh, I will uh, let it go with that, Mr. Chair, and simply say move approval of the recommended action. I asked for a second, and I know we have questions from at least one colleague. Thank you. That's also the year that I asked a short blonde to marry me. Aww. All right. <laughs> so we uh, do not have any speakers. Do we have a second? I'll second. I'll second. Supervisor Please. Lee, you sneaked in ahead of Supervisor Chavez. And if we don't have any comment, we, oops, Vice President Ellenberg, you raised your hand. I did. Uh, I am absolutely in, in support of the referral. I, I think that a key piece to the success here is that we fill the chief data officer and chief privacy officer uh, positions quickly and, and have both of those uh, positions continue to report directly to the COO so that they are you know, really empowered to direct the silo busting and data sharing work uh, that will allow us to better serve our residents. And I'm wondering if uh, Dr. Smith or John Mills or anyone just has any brief information on the status of those two hiring efforts? Asking for an update on those hiring efforts. And if not available now, I'm happy for the board uh, to get that on off agenda. agenda. They are pretty critical roles to doing this work well. They're in the middle of uh, recruitment at this point. Thank you. All righty, Supervisor Ellenberg. Your hand went down, Supervisor Chavez, your hand went up. Thank you. Um, so one is I, I, I'm very interested in the, the getting the update. I think that makes a lot of sense. 
Supervisor Samidi, and this is really a question for you. I know that um, as policies get updated, that there should or would maybe need to be a process of some of those policies being brought back um, to the board. And I wonder if you had thought a little bit about um, if that goes to a committee, if it goes to the full board. And, the, and, and let me just say, the reason I'm asking the question is that one area that that I know we've had a lot of challenges change, is- so. Oh, uh, Jeff, you're not on the microphone is still on. Go um, ahead, please. Thanks. Um, one, one area that I have been thinking a lot about is some of the challenges we've had between departments relative to data sharing as we're managing our privacy work. And I think that that this may be an opportunity to actually have more um, thoughtful, robust um, discussions about intentionality and how do we balance um, you know, privacy and security with also being able to properly support patients, especially the high need patients that, you know, anyway. So I, I, I was just interested in how you thought that would come back to the board. Um, I don't have a predisposition <clears throat> about whether or not any of this conversation go uh, through committee along the way. Uh, the recommended action, of course, uh, simply calls for it to come back to the board on August the 16th with uh, 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 possible actions. And of course, I've, I've called out the um, specific ordinance A16, uh, information practices and individual privacy, because it's the, forgive me, the guts of uh, our uh, code uh, on this subject. But I do, uh, so I'm open Supervisor Chavez, that's probably what I should have led with. Uh, and and I, I do think uh, one of the reasons that the language of the referral is written the way it is, is because um, we're talking not only about um, the ordinance uh, and board policies, but as you'll see in the language, it says other county department protocols, procedures, and operations regarding data privacy and security. So it's to your point, but I am happy to call out and include explicitly the very important uh, issue of uh, how we have essentially have it both ways, protect people's privacy and confidentiality while still doing the data sharing, we need to deliver the best possible services to them. And I think to your point, and forgive me, Mr. Chair, but it's it's an issue that it's too easy to overlook in the moment when people are trying to do the good work. If we don't have uh, good language on the books that's current uh, and relevant to the way we do our work today. So I'm, I'm happy to incorporate that uh, with the consent of a seconder. Seconder consenting. Thank, Thank you. you. And on that, just to, to further um, for staff's information, I think in addition, like I, I imagine that some of these are dusty and I thought your point about what was still in the banker's box is really important. <laughs> I also was hoping that staff, um, when they're doing this body of work, if there's other um, um, technical issues they need to address, for example, some that are just some parts of these codes that are so outdated, they just need to be dumped that they have the, you know, the supervisor submitted and that the staff can come back with what, what should be fixed as we're doing this as well. Um, you know, along with how long do they think this will take? How would they prioritize the work? Because I, I, to go back to the point you raised earlier, um, I think one of the big questions we have to be able to answer is what, with intentionality, how is the board prioritizing uh, privacy, security, and um, and able to facilitate the work. And that that may be some overarching work that the whole board needs to look at and then other parts of it not. But if the staff could come back with a, a good process, I, I would be very interested in that as well. And, and also the cost, you know, what does it cost to do this? I think that would be important to know. Thank the you. Cost will be in there. All right, anybody else? Seeing none, no speakers. Peggy, you're up. Supervisor Lee. Hi. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. And Peggy, we handled 13 through 20 under consent. So we're, tur we're turning to item 21 for Dr. Smith to give his report. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, 
I think uh, I'll reserve all of the discussion today to the changes in the vaccination policy. Gotcha. Um, I think the best way to try to explain this is to think about it in terms of the duties that employees have in addition to the locations where they work. Um, the policy that existed uh, in the county before the public health order in December had to do with the positions and the work that was done by employees. What happened is we sat down with department heads and uh, managers and conscientiously reviewed all of the work that was done by their employees and identified it as either low risk, medium risk, or high risk. Then when the public health order was issued in December, which I'll remind everybody in the public is separate from co county policy, it's a public health order related to the general public health of the entire county, what it focused upon was vaccinated or unvaccinated individuals in particular work environments, not necessarily what they were doing, but where they worked. That meant that some of our employees who had previously been identified as low or medium risk now had limitations upon where they could work and how they could be reasonably accommodated for their exemptions, whether they were health exemptions or religious exemptions. Once that changed um, and the public health order was removed, that brought us back to our general um, policy, administrative policy, about vaccinations, which meant now we're still back focused upon the work that's being done. So employees can still apply for a um, exemption for either of those two reasons. We're still involved in trying to find accommodations um, for those workers who can't continue with their particular job. Um, and we're um, working on that since April 1st. So the theory behind this is that um, some workers um, in, the <clears throat> in the past were able to do high-risk activities before we had vaccinations, and we were trying to protect the employee from the virus because we knew that in large count, large amount, the virus was in the hospitals, in the jails, in our community. Now there's a transition from the focus to protect our clients because we have an obligation to prevent clients from getting ill. So for example, um, staff working in the neonatal intensive care unit or in the intensive care unit or in the radiation oncology area. All of those areas are areas where there's high risk to our clients from infection. So that's the focus of the three uh, tiers of risk. So with that, I'll end and take your questions. Thank you. Dr. Smith, I've just got one that perplexes me. When these individuals are wearing a mask, a shield, um, they're wearing gloves and a shield, wouldn't that alleviate concerns? No, actually the mask is pretty much intended to protect the wearer not the um, client. So wearing a mask and gloves doesn't prevent the transmission to clients. So what, it doesn't, okay. So if a nurse 
has COVID and wearing gloves and a mask, they, they can still transfer COVID to the client? Yes. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Lee. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, we certainly have uh, been hearing a lot of comments for the past few meetings from those who've worked in the high risk settings and uh, been being put on leave. Um, I've also learned that some of those nurses who are currently on leave are near the retirement age, and they share that their retirements may be impacted because they will not be able to work full uh, the full service years in PERS and will be medically vested uh, while they're being placed on leave. So the question for uh, Dr. Smith is if you might be able to speak on how the retirement of those staff members who may be placed on leave in these high risk settings may be impacted on this leave, or if you don't have it, maybe we could just get an off agenda report to, um, to address that. Thank you. Yes, it would be based on individual situations. So we'll have to get you an off agenda report. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, thanks so much. I'm going to ask for some information for an off agenda as well, but I, I just want to make sure I heard Dr. Smith correctly because the, the public health campaign for two years was you wear your mask to protect me, I wear my mask to protect you, and that it specifically does protect the other person as opposed to the one wearing it. So what, what, what you said sounds in direct contradiction to the public health campaign. Did, can, can you help me understand that? I think there's been quite a bit of study done on masking and um, it's shown that it's more protective for the wearer than it is for the other person on the other side. We can get you an off agenda about that. Yeah, that that really is just so entirely different from everything that we've told the public for the last couple of years. That that really that concerns me a lot. Um, I also continue to be concerned about the status and the clarity on next steps uh, regarding unvaccinated county employees with improved exemptions that work in high risk settings. I, I heard what you said, um, but I still feel like I don't have um, the information that, that I really need to understand this. And um, some specific things that I've requested from the dais at prior meetings haven't yet uh, been provided. And, and of course I recognize that specific uh, details are confidential. So if this needs to be addressed in, in closed session or with county council, I'm open to those approaches. Uh, but at a minimum, I want to uh, direct that the board needs to see in an off agenda, a current tally of all employees by department and or classification who have approved exemptions and whether they have been accommodated in another position as of the date of the report. And for those who have not been accommodated, whether they are on paid or unpaid status, obviously de-identified uh, or aggregate numbers. Uh, is appropriate. Second, a clear written statement of the parameters of the high risk settings and roles as they currently stand under federal, state, and local rules. And, and this clarity, this written clarity really needs to be provided to our labor partners as well. And third, please, a clear process for obtaining reasonable accommodations for the employees with, appro with approved exemptions in those high risk settings or roles that comply with uh, state and federal government. I, I wanna hear that our process is very supportive of getting employees to work in, in whatever role uh, is appropriate to their circumstances and that it's clearly communicated to the employees, to their managers and to their labor representatives. I understand that the accommodation process is really meant to be a mutual conversation and that the burden is not uh, fully on the employee to uh, to have to make applications. So, however, is appropriate confidential memo or or open off agenda memo from administration and county council uh, as as soon as possible, please. Um, and to add a discussion of this item um, 
it's my request to President Wasserman uh, to add a discussion of this item, please, to the next closed session to the extent legally permissible to do so on April 18th. Thank you, James, and you pick that up as well, so that'll, that'll happen. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just give super, uh, Supervisor um, Dr. Smith um, a moment to respond to the, the um, request for information from Supervisor Ellenberg. And the reason I'm asking this is I, I think this information has been requested before. In fact, I know it has from different members of the board even. And so I'm just wondering if there's some, if there's some problem with producing it. Dr. Smith? Oh, there's no problem. It's just uh, that it is labor intensive. We've been working on it um, because not everybody who's on paid administrative leave is on leave because of uh, reasonable accommodation problems. Some are on leave because they fail to comply with uh, requesting a exemption. Some are on leave prior to the institution of the policy. Um, some are still going through the Skelly process. So it's not it's not uh, confidential or anything like that. We'll get you the information. Dr. Smith is, um, so this would not, and maybe I asked this of you and, and uh, James. So that means that um, this information could be part of a public agenda, I mean, a, a, yeah, a, a public board agenda item versus a closed session item? As long as it's de-identified, yes. Great, even better. So then perhaps that can come back to the board on the 19th? Is that reasonable, Dr. Smith? Yeah, we'll get you everything we have. So Supervisor Wasserman, if, if that can be part of the agenda on the 19th, that would be helpful. I think that would help us just kind of nail all this down publicly I'm, and all that. I'm all hearing right. that from multiple supervisors. Yes, we'll we'll put that on the agenda. Thank you. Go over as much as we can. All righty. I don't see any other hands raised. Dr. Smith, anything else you wish to add? Nope, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to County Council, James Williams. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of April 4th, 2022. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Williams. That was 21 was Dr. Smith, 22 was Mr. Williams. We now turn to item number 23, which is a report on the assisted outpatient treatment program from Sherry. And I know we had set this up for about six month reports, as I remember, Sherry. And it's kind of early right now, but we appreciate whatever information you can share with us at this time. Great. Uh, good afternoon, President Wasserman, members of the Board of Supervisors, Sherry Terrell, Director with Behavioral Health Services Department, and um, Sue Young, our uh, Division Director with our Adult and Older Adult Division within Behavioral Health Services, will provide an update on the AOT report, and we would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I appreciate that. And anybody wishing to speak on this item, please register electronically. Um, board members, if it's all right with you, we'll hear from the public first. And um, this again is simply a receiving report. There is no action being requested at this time. Peggy, with our speakers, uh, two minutes each, please. Yes, and to let you know, um, at least one of the speakers had raised their hand during um, the county executive report. And yes, we don't do, thank you. We don't do public comment during county, yes, county council and CEO. Thank you for that though, I appreciate it. I, I lowered the hands, at least one of them is up again, but I will call the speakers in order. Our first speaker is Delia Polito. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, yeah, this was to respond to the um, county executive. I think that we should have a chance to respond to that because it's outrageous what is being said. 
I mean, the fact that he's saying that masks don't protect the public, that it's only it only protects the person wearing it, then why those in low and intermediate risk have to wear it? It should Thank be- Thank you, Dalila. I need, I need to interrupt you as you had an opportunity to speak on this prior and our policy is not public comment during county council and county executive. So if you wish, wish to speak about the assisted outpatient treatment, uh, now you can. Um, if not, we need to move on to the next speaker. And I apologize, I did mute her um, or close it out. If you do wish to speak, Delilah, on this item, please raise your hand again and I will open your mic. Thank you. She has not re-raised her hand. The next speaker is Danelle Fedor. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, um, good morning. I think it's still good morning, um, supervisors and, and the county staff. My name is Danelle Fedor. I'm a resident of Santa Clara County. I'm also a candidate for the Supervisorial District 1 uh, race. I just wanted to share that I support um, the assisted outpatient treatment uh, program. I think it's really important for, um, for our county to have options and to make sure that those options are informative. Uh, not every option is a cure um, and not every option is good for every person. Um, so it's important to have choices, um, especially when it comes to outpatient treatment. Um, I also want to share that I'm very supportive of nonprofit. Uh, my apologies. I clicked the button. Danielle, if you or Danielle, if you could please continue um, at the unmute again. So sorry. Sure. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to add um, to the assisted outpatient treatment that I do think it's important to also blend nonprofit partnerships um, when able. I, I work for a nonprofit that is a partnership with the county serving uh, Section 8 housing voucher recipients. Um, and I, I think it's important part of what the county does to have those relationships. Um, I also want to share two other things to, that goes with outpatient treatment. Is one is I'm supportive of the care court that is going through the legislation now. Um, the care court was a recommendation by Governor Newsom that all counties would have resources to help mentally ill people. Um, and then lastly, I think it would be great to relook at Old City Hall as a mental health facility, as a resource. Um, you had looked relooked at um, a property earlier, I think agenda item 10. And I think it's always important to relook at facilities that are being unused to see if they could be part of our mental health um, care that we provide as a county. Uh, thank you for listening and for your consideration. Thank you. The next speaker is Teresa. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. You know what? Can you hear me? Yes. I am so sorry because um, I know you don't want me to comment. <laughs> But I just want to say, can you please hold Jeff accountable? I'm sorry, Peggy, you need to cut that one off. I, I did. Thank you. And the next speaker is Jill Borders. Please accept the unmute to begin. Hi, thank you. You know, this is my first county meeting, so I apologize. You can tell me if this is not the right place for this comment. Um, but I've had um, a lot of ideas of how we can move forward with um, behavioral health and increasing the amount of therapists and workers that can help in this area. And I have no idea if this is the place to put it, but I've had this idea for so long, I have to share it. Please. Um, thank you. Uh, so I understand, I have several people in my life that have become therapists, friends that are working on becoming therapists. And a lot of them talk about the 3000 hours of training that they have to put in before becoming an official you know, therapist. Um, and this has probably been discussed by you before, but for those of us, who aren't attending all these meetings and up on you guys have already gone through you know it just seems like there's got to be a way that there can be supervisors you know at excuse me supervisors meaning um for these therapists in training at a county level as opposed to in private practice or whatnot um and use these people to help get their three thousand hours so that we can really quickly get all these people working and helping we have so it's a just like a dire need all the people in my life that are therapists they are completely overwhelmed having to turn down clients daily so 
if there's a way that we could streamline this process with the county's help to get these th these people with these 3000 hours to get them a supervisor even on the county level somehow to to get that moving i, I just feel like it could be a, a way to quickly get more mental health workers thank you thank you and your idea jill just got to our director of behavioral health services all right next person um that was actually jill had i think re raised her hand on accident and that concludes our speakers thank you very much and thank you, Sherry, for this uh, 20 plus page report. Um, you're certainly off and running. We really appreciate that. And again, this is received report. No motion needed. Uh, Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Yes, I just want to make a comment on uh, thanking uh, Sherry and your team to uh, be implementing this LT program um, so um, smoothly so far. Obviously, hiring people is difficult, uh, and this, especially during these uh, times but I certainly see that a lot of progress being made. And I want to thank the staff for being so responsive to our questions earlier uh, regarding the outreach, for example, that's been happening, uh, that uh, you've been able to you know, conduct over uh, 11 sessions of outreach and, and reaching over uh, about 200 people or so. Uh, and that, uh, and one of the answers you mentioned that there's 12 individuals have already been referred to the AOT program. So it's a, it's a Quick start starting February 16th, right? So just started basically um, uh, about yes. less than two months ago. Um, so do you have any uh, other thoughts you'd like to share uh, about the report? Sure, I'll go ahead and turn that over to Sue to share any other updates that she'd like to share with the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's we received over 250 calls so mm -hmm. far as counting a last at the end of last week. Um, our staff, our triage team have been working really hard. We're meeting daily, um, really um, just to go over other referrals. We received over 50 referrals at this time. Um, of course, not all referrals meet the AOT criteria. So our staff are really doing the record checking, um, you know, talking to the, the referral parties. Um, just to make sure that individuals being referred are either meeting the AOT criteria, then we will go out to really work and engage with them. If they don't meet the AOT criteria, then we also work with them to try to connect them to other services so that they're not just kind of left hanging. Um, and so we've actually met with them to call the call center together, connect them to other services uh, that they may qualify for, um, things like that. Um, and we are also working actively with our advisory committee. I I know that one of the, um, the important part of this program is really making sure that we're tracking data and able to provide report. So it's still early in the stage, as you know, and um, we just kind of finalized our admission survey that's been attached to the, um, the report. And uh, we've been kind of um, discussing with the advisory committee about how we're gonna uh, evaluate this. Um, the state has a number of extensive reports that they require for us to provide. And so I've already shared that with our advisory committee. When we meet next time in May, we're gonna actually go over them to really discuss the best way to make sure that our program is impacting the way we want it to impact, but also that we are tracking information so that if there's any gaps or if there are areas of areas of improvement, we wanna make sure that we are able to uh, really track them to, to do that. And so they've been actively involved in this process at this time, and we'll continue to meet to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Uh, Sue, just a, a follow up about those those calls. Can you generalize where they are coming from? Are they law enforcement? Are they family members? What's the what's the general mix? I yeah. assume people aren't self reporting. Yeah, a lot of the uh, calls are from the, the general public or the family members. Um, our partners um, are pretty aware because we've done extensive uh, presentations and training with our partners and community agencies. So uh -huh. typically they do call, but oftentimes they'll actually provide referrals through the emails um, that we have mailbox or inquire, inquire through the emails. Uh -huh. A lot of the calls are coming from the family members and community members. Some are just asking more about the program. Some are really just wanting to get connected to any type of behavioral health. 
So it's not always AOT related that right. we will connect them back to the call center, you know, um, and have them um, be connected to the staff there. But oftentimes our staff will be answering um, calls, sometimes actually doing the referrals on the phone because they may not necessarily know how to really fill out the form um, as well. And so the staff will walk through them together um, and provide, you know, or try to get as much information as they can. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll go from there. Thanks so much. And it really is encouraging to hear that even if they don't qualify for AOT, AOT and we know that that's such a narrow uh, set of criteria that we are still connecting them uh, yeah. to levels of service that may be more appropriate. Um, I just want to make a, a, a general comment as well. The progress report, as well as uh, the trust report uh, that was on consent today, represent two priority programs uh, for the for the board of supervisors, among several others, of course. Uh, in the context of uh, the school-based behavioral health report at last week's CFSC, I had shared a comment um, that I would like staff to provide recommendations at the April nineteenth report back on the, the response to the declaration of a public health crisis that, uh, for uh, mental health and, and substance use disorders that will allow staff to bundle reports on priority programs alongside our core system issues like workforce facilities, uh, data and IT infrastructure so that the board can, can weigh in and see programs in the context of their entire systems rather than dispersed across multiple policy committees and, and multiple timelines. I'm, I'm thinking that this could look like the quarterly jail study sessions as a format, but I'm I'm totally open to other approaches from uh, from staff or from my colleagues. Uh, AOT is a, is a really important new element in the adult system of care, but success in the program is tied to so many other aspects of our behavioral system of care. Um, so I, I be open to to comments either from from colleagues or staff uh, on an approach now or or happy to hold that discussion until our our next meeting which i know is already going to be quite lengthy um, when we get that systems report back i just turn to sherry do you have any an initial thoughts on that kind of comprehensive quarterly presentation Sure. sure. Um, we very much appreciate your comments, both at the Children, Seniors and Families Committee with Supervisor Chavez, um, as well as today. I do um, agree that um, perhaps bundling some of these items together um, and showing a more comprehensive approach to our work plans and approaches, as you've stated, multiple systems and partners are involved in the work. Um, and I think um, at times having segmented the conversations and information to multiple committees does not allow for a more full comprehensive conversation. And so um, during the April 19th presentation, uh, we will be bringing that back together in a more comprehensive way. And I do appreciate um, the idea of perhaps um, a semi-annual uh, report back to the board as um, I believe the jail reform study session happens, um, could be an option, but certainly happy to, to have a fuller conversation on April 19th about that. Right. Thank you so much, Sherry and, and Sue and your whole team. I really appreciate the work. Yep, so absolutely. Much. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two uh, observations. The first is, uh, is a suggestion, and I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to try and uh, offer it as a formal motion or direction to staff. But I really do want to encourage our team to think about partnering with nonprofits. I think this was mentioned by one of our public speakers earlier, particularly in the area of outreach. And we know there are folks who um, we heard from during this uh, consideration previously uh, in San Mateo County and in Alameda County and the nonprofit world. I'm sure there are folks here in Santa Clara County uh, already who would be well suited to do the work. And I'm saying, uh, I mean, I'm making that suggestion or encouraging that consideration uh, because I think, um, candidly, sometimes I think our nonprofits can be a bit more nimble uh, than our county in uh, bringing folks on board and putting them to work uh, sooner rather than later. And I know that's what you're hoping to do here. So I'll just let that go unsaid uh, without anything else said, but I, I do feel strongly it's 
a place where there's some potential. The second thing, uh, Mr. Chair is and colleagues is, I, I wanna say thank you to Ms. Tarao and her staff, including uh, Su Jung, uh, but all the other folks have been working to make this happen because uh, this is an interesting exercise for our county uh, in terms of governance. The professional staff came to the Health and Hospital Committee and recommended against an opt-in. This was they, they did not want to go down this path initially. Um, Supervisor Lee and I had a different take. We thought that it probably was time to opt in. We had a special hearing where we could let folks with experience in the field share their stories and uh, perhaps articulate for us a path forward that um, would make opting in a successful venture. The professional staff of our county, after a 5-0 vote from our board, if I remember correctly, said, all right, that's the will of the board. It's not where we were headed initially, but now we're going to make this work. And in my view, that's how governance ought to work, uh, that you have a real robust conversation about the pluses and the minuses of different approaches. Good people of goodwill will sometimes have a, a different take. Uh, but ultimately, we got to, I think, a real consensus on our board, and the staff was prepared to implement that consensus policy direction, notwithstanding the fact that it wasn't where they started out. So I think, you know, I wanted to highlight it because in a day and age when people ask, can we make government work? I think the answer is, yeah, we can. And I want to give credit to staff because uh, not all of us are great at saying, all right, I'm going to take the direction I was given, even if it wasn't the initial direction I wanted, and I'm gonna make it work. So thank you for that and stay at it and uh, much appreciated. Super, thank you all very much. We don't, oh, we do, Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sherry I, and, and Sue Jung, I'm not sure the right person asked this to, but if somebody's homeless and they get into our program, where do they go? Um, yeah, I could I can answer that. So right now, um, so it depends on the level of engagement. So on the early on, if they are willing, then we actually have shelters that we try to provide. We do have a housing program for clients in this program. So while we're working on outreach and engagement with them, um, sometimes we will actually refer them and, and place them in our shelter temporarily until we can locate appropriate housing for them. We do have what we call master lease housing or share housing program as part of the program. And so as soon as they are ready and um, I guess a little bit more securely engaged with the staff, we will move them into that site. We haven't yet so far, we're actually working on two clients that are in our AOT program that we're working towards moving them in in the near future. Um, so that's what we're doing. And we are also planning to expand this master lease housing program in the new fiscal year as well. Um, and so we're hoping that, um, I mean, we recognize that of the, the 12 people who are in AOT program, 11 are um, unhoused clients. And so we recognize the need. And so we are trying to expand the housing program to actually place them in those places so that the services could also take place there as well. Yeah, I think one thing um, that I'm going to be really interested in us getting a much stronger understanding of is how, how the housing program really concretely, like if they're homeless, this happens and this happens and then this mm -hmm. happens. And I know the point you're raising, which I think is a very, very important one, which is that um, you know, that, that a lot of it's going to be based on the need of the client. The, the thing I always um, thought about the AOT model was that it was designed for folks who perhaps had more family support than um, some folks may that, that, are, uh, that are really high need. And if, and if that's not the case and we're really able to support them through this program, that's great. If that is the case, I want to know what options do we have for folks who are homeless, if not AOT. Right, right. And thank you. Um, and uh, so far, actually, some of the calls that we received or the referrals that we received from the family members are family members who are supportive and yet at their wit's end. And they really want us to kind of take over and provide uh, the help 
because they didn't know or they don't know what else to do with them. So in this case, our staff were actively involved in providing support for the typically the, the parents. Um, but while we're also working with the individual referred in connecting with them and getting them into the program. Thank you very much. Yeah, one last thing I just wanted to say is I do really want us to get an agendized item about how what numbers people call and how they're being triaged. Um, I just think I know, Sherry, you're working really hard on that, but I think each time this comes forward, we need to better understand how we're whittling this down and whether or not it makes sense for us to be using 911 or 311 or 211. I mean, I know those are all issues that you're addressing right now, but I, I think that one of the biggest challenges we have is not people not understanding how to access a service means we don't really have a service. And and I and I do think it's confusing. And I I've called some of our numbers and I'm I'm I feel like I read everything you send me and I couldn't assess where someone goes and on off often um, there's no there's no place for them. And and that may be that we have a gap in service, which is why I'm really asking the question. So thank you and thanks for the good work. This is really, really exciting. I echo that. Thank you very much. It is awfully exciting in providing a new service. And if your particular service can't help that person, the referral, Sherry and Sue, to another part of the county that can. Bottom line is that we help, we help the person. And uh, I like the direction we're going. And you've been launched uh, eight weeks ago. And so uh, good, good luck as we continue forward. You're doing a great job assembling your staff and uh, getting all on the same page. Thank all right, su supervisors, thank you. Thank you, Sherry, thank you, Sue. Thank you. That we consider item number 23 received. With that, we move on to item 25, Consuelo, who is gonna to report to us regarding the Collaborative Hotel Placement Program and there's Consuelo. Thank you very much. Good morning, President Wasserman and members of the board. Consuelo Hernandez here, Director with the Office of Supportive Housing. Uh, in the, I will just give you a, a brief summary of the two options that the administration has developed and then happy to take questions. The first is in short to expand a service that we already provide. Um, over the course of the year, we provide about 150 overnight beds in hotel programs through um, what we refer to as flexible funding. And we are currently going through an RFP process for all of our basic needs. So if the board wanted us to augment that, we can do that through our negotiations and the fiscal impact um, would be considered either in the current uh, proposed fiscal year 23, 23 annual budget process, or it can come later um, in August or September. I will share with you that the dollar amount um, that was included in the staff report of approximately $175 per night is the pre-pandemic amount. Um, during the pandemic, we were able to negotiate uh, lower rates. Um, for instance, in our vulnerable hotel model program, this is the uh, project room key, if you will, the nightly rate was $105. And the cost um, to provide services minus the supportive services was $175 per night. Um, so that's the difference really is um, the rates were just so low for us during the pandemic. The second program um, is something new. It would be a pilot permanent housing program that would be focused on what we refer to as folks that fall into the minimal intervention categories. Um, so in our supportive housing system, there's uh, generally three big categories of folks. Um, we are talking about those that um, have very short periods of homelessness, um, and by connecting them to a hotel program, um, then they would be able to very quickly resolve their homelessness and address some of the underlying issues of why they become homeless. We do not have a program like this now. Um, it would be something that we would basically take some of the lessons learned from travel in, um, that was the original referral last year from Supervisor Lee, um, and apply some of those lessons, talk to other um, users, um, come up with an RFP, and then come back with the, the fiscal impact of that program. Um, because it is something new, we, we do ask for a little time in exploring that. And happy to take any questions for President Watson. Thank you very much, Consuelo. Supervisor Lee. 
Uh, I'm ready to make a motion to support both of these uh, recommendations, but at the same time, I, I guess I would like to hear public appearance or uh, comments first. No members of the public. So you have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, anything else you wish or we'll take a vote? Yeah, I'm surprised the public has not showed up yet. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, let me get to my comments here real quick. My guess is they would show up and be in support of this. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we have a few that might do it. You know, uh, look, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, we, we are trying to get people off the streets, right? And, and uh, of course, placing people uh, in permanent support housing is our ultimate goal. But certainly our success should not be just measured by that, but also even placing people uh, off the street for even a short amount of time to me is still very much needed. Um, I, I think the report is is very very well uh, um, comparing some of the uh, actual data because the the Ferox program uh, the one that in Sunnyvale would move to Sunnyvale travel in is something that's very new uh, and I do believe that it's actually a additional tool in the toolkit that we don't have uh, to help complement the certain uh, programs we have right now to the shelter beds. Problem with the shelter beds right now is that they are always full. Uh, right now, we have the Sunnyvale Shelton Hamlin, the San Jose Little Orchard, and it's practically full every night. And even if we double our shelter best capability tomorrow, they still be full because right now, with, you know, the social distancing requirement is COVID. Uh, the shelter capacity has really been way too low based on the needs that we need. So we really need other places to, to house them. Um, you know, we still have thousands of people sleeping in the streets in our county every night. Uh, and Obviously, since we are serious about addressing homelessness, we need more short-term housing solutions. Um, the you know many many things have been tried. But we tried tiny homes, we tried pallet homes, containerized housing, modular housing, converting motels, uh, and these are all solutions. That one of the biggest problems is finding a place to put them has been very difficult. Uh, the nimbyism is a big part of the problem, and even after finding a suitable place to the, to potentially build this, it still takes at least six to 12 months to build. Um, and, and, and we've even passed this proposal with the lead on uh, my uh, colleague, Supervisor Wasserman, I'm assuming mean, Supervisor uh, 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 Sumidian, on the building of containerized housing up to you know, potentially 16 sites uh, a few months ago. But to date, as far as I know, only probably one was approved, a couple more are still on hold being rejected because they don't have enough money from Project Home Key. And so, you know, as much as we can keep continuing waiting for these projects, there are still hundreds of hotel room beds that are left vacant in this county. And what these motel rooms will provide is that something unique that is not provided currently, is that it does provide a safe space to stay there immediately, i.e. practically tonight, with the privacy and dignity that currently does not exist. Shelters can fulfill this need because they are full. So I just want to mention that because um, this is a bit out of the box of a thinking of how to do this. And I really think that the ability for us to continue to find ways to increase our temporary housing uh, stock is, is very important. I appreciate very much what uh, staff has put together on the report. Uh, and on the first uh, option regarding the increasing numbers, 100 or so 150 nights for the whole county of 2 million people it really seems that the access or the, the program really needs to be expanded significantly. I thank staff for being able to uh, uh, find you know, funding from state to be able to fulfill uh, uh, and make probably very little uh, budget impact to us. And so we can increase that program significantly, that'll be great. Um, I, I mean, for our county, I certainly don't think a thousand nights per year would be high at all, given the amount of needs of people who need these short-term placement of just getting in by, they came to you know, permanent supportive housing very soon. They just need a couple of nights to move in before they get to family. So I would love to get that program to be expanded significantly, number one. And number two is to uh, make it easier for people to access the program. Uh, I just want to share, I mean, I personally tried to find uh, spaces from people I knew needed a few nights here and there uh, this past year, and I found that very difficult through our own system. And at the end of the day, I have to go through the Nonprofit side with Destination Home with Jen Loving's group, along with uh, BMC Foundation, we're able to get some housing vouchers to put folks in. Uh, this seems to be the type of program that we, the county, should be able to provide at least from our own office 
uh, there should be ways to ac access it. So hopefully we can make that a little bit more easily accessible on the option one. On the second one, uh, staff recommendation talks about those who have lower needs. And I think I, I certainly agree with that. Lower needs are definitely ones that we absolutely have to provide, but that only covers about 15 to 20% of those uh, who would be able to be served. Uh, for those who have higher needs, I certainly don't want to completely reject them. And I certainly think that uh, the option, to, the, the program coming back to us in the future, I would like that staff to look into being able to at least provide some type of assessment for uh, individuals with living in tents. One thing we learn about the uh, result of the Ferox Parks project is that those are definitely folks who have the high security. They are the ones literally sleeping in tents every night. There are 31 of them at the Ferox Park. And of course, they have all kinds of different needs. And I really believe that having the assessment being provided to all these type of individuals uh, and even the few nights sometimes would really be be such a huge help to them. So I certainly want to uh, make sure that uh, the, they, they do not completely get lost uh, in this new proposal coming through. And finally, I want to talk about the issue with the cities. Uh, the city of San Jose certainly has a very robust program on dealing with the unhoused issues. But the other 14 you know, towns and cities now county, not so much. They don't have the staff, and many of them, frankly, just relied on the county. Uh, city officials I speak with, like the Milpitas, have always asked for the county to house their fairly small number of unhoused community, approximately somewhere around 70 to 100. The problem is that the county's prioritization system through the VI's Spadet provide points, and for those who don't score high enough, they don't get housed. And of course, there's not enough housing, and then there's not enough shelter beds. And so Sometimes these beds are also, even though available, might not be close enough. For example, it really doesn't make sense to how somebody uh, who is homeless in Nopias or Palo Alto down in Morning Hill, Gilroy. Uh, and so I would like to be able to have a program where the city officials or philanthropic groups have some type of ability to help place those on house in their own community into this housing nearby, whether this might be a motel. And the county should be able to help support that. So I would like to ask to add that into uh, the, the proposal here to look into making sure that there's some ways that the, the cities will be able to, to do that. Um, and, you know, this, this is something that, uh, uh, that I, I'm, I'm very uh, passionate about. I think many people have known uh, on, on these unhoused issues and that the more local uh, folks really want to help the neighbors and I want to make sure that uh, possibility is made available through this program moving forward. Um, and um, and I think that's all the comments I have on, on this one. Um, and if any clarification staff wants with me, thanks. Thank you. So we have a motion to pursue both the one option and the second option that Consuelo described. We've got a second for that motion as well. And now we do have a couple of speakers who have, who have come in, Supervisor Lee. So we'll do that. But first, let's hear from Supervisor Chavez. And then um, we have a motion and a sign. Mike, the speaker's first, and then I'll go. You want to hear from the speakers first. All right. We have a couple of speakers. Peggy, let's go for two minutes each. We have a motion to pursue the two options. We have a second for the two options. I'm certainly in favor of pursuing options, however necessary. Peggy, go ahead. Our next speaker is Nassim Nouri. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Nassim, can you accept the unmute? I will come back to you. We'll go to the second speaker, Irvish. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Thank you very much to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I want to emphasize on uh, uh, the Board of Supervisors consideration for the modal replacement program. Though we know that, uh, that there are, uh, from state government's perspective, there, are, there, are, there is a home key project program as well as uh, program assistance available for the housing needs for the, uh, for the individuals and as well as for the household. I also wanted to emphasize about the FEMAS, the Federal Emergency Management Agencies individual and household program that provides a financial and direct services to those affected by the disaster as well, which falls for the people who are uninsured, underinsured, and also covering the expenses under within the serious needs. 
Now the differentiation between those terms and the program is that, that some of the applicants, they be able to book, uh, book, the, uh, book the rooms in the motel by themselves within the participating list within the city and the county. And then there is a transitional sheltering as well, whereas they get the assistance from the home key project as well. However, we are talking about the individuals which are able to, which are also underinsured and uninsured as well. So I request Board of Supervisor to consider the programs from the FEMA agencies as well, where they get the public assistance from the different agencies. And regardless, regardless of the considering that whether they are homeless or not, because there are people who are underinsured, uninsured, as well as there are people who are eligible as a part of a household programs as well, which requires a sheltering assistance as well. By co-aligning all the needs in a one single program would not suffice the requirements. So it would be better to segregate and then implement. Thank you, Ramesh. Next speaker um, is telephone ending 910. Please accept the unmute to begin. Telephone 910, there you go. Um, first, I would like to thank Supervisor Lee for his um, eagerness to learn about uh, being unhoused. I mean, I can't think of a person who has spent more time literally being on the ground learning this issue and talking to unhoused people face to face. I appreciate his eagerness to learn, his dedication, um, and as he said, his passion. Um, I just can't say enough about it. Um, I was heavily involved in the travel in program. Um, I actually helped people lead the protest um, that forced the city of Sunnyvale to create this program. So I appreciate that. Um, I was super involved, probably more than people wanted me to be and um, support everything in both of these motions. Um, one of the reasons that it was such a success was you moved an entire camp in together and they supported each other. And we need more programs like that. And this offers that. Um, it also is because people going to a shelter don't have any security. They can't lock a door. It creates more anxiety and mental health problems being in a shelter. Being in a hotel in a supportive environment with wraparound services, the ability to lock a door, uh, the ability to have all the providers that are helping you find you in one location and to have the people from your camp around you and support you is enormous. And the people who were involved in that program still support that program. I talked to them last night and I just, we need to do more of that. Um, and I support this wholeheartedly. Most of you know who I am and usually I call and to complain and throw a fit. And I'm just saying that I will call and throw a fit and complain if we don't support this. So please support it. Thank you. And going back to Nassim Nouri, please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Nassim Nouri. I'm with the Green Party of Santa Clara County. And I too want to uh, express my deep gratitude for Supervisor Lee. I am proud that you are my representative. And this program can be the perfect example of how advocates and community organizers come together with our electeds who are willing to sit down and listen to their constituents who are unhoused and the advocates who serve that community and build something that facilitates other cities taking advantage of the enormously valuable lessons that have been learned previously with this program. So I want to also express my appreciation for all the supervisors who are going to support this. It is important that we see this step taken so that we can marry the intentions and the efforts of the community with all of you who represent us and form policy and form make these decisions to support your constituents. Thank you so much. Please support this and vote yes. Thank you. Thank and you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion, we have a second. Oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Chavez, you wanted to speak after the speakers. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I do wanna just um, thank Supervisor Lee for bringing this forward. I wanna just share a couple of reflections that I have. And one is that um, 
I, I do think that it, there's a value in us looking at the current um, um, process, the VDOT spit out process in general, and better understanding what we've learned. Because now, Consuelo, I think over this from 2015 to now, we've had so many people moving in and out of the, the service systems that we're in that this might be the right time uh, to take a look at them. I think one of the points that Supervisor Lee's raising around, um, you know, folks who have lower need, but that, you know, just need a, an interim opportunity that it's probably a very cost saving way to, to start to look at um, partnering something like that with the rapid rehousing program that you already um, are operating. So I think those are really good directions. I do want to say that I, I think there has to be a much deeper partnership with the cities and I, I you know, um, you know, Supervisor Lee and others just to be direct, I think, I think there have only been really a couple of cities that have really engaged with us and I, I don't believe, I, I think it would be um, it could negatively impact long term the work we're trying to do with the homeless community if the cities are in a position of it being our responsibility versus a real shared responsibility with each of the cities. And depending on the cities we're working with, there's a, it's not just a, I mean, it's a budgetary question, but it's a budgetary question for us as well. It's also a, a priority question. So I'm, I'm really interested in the staff's um, options. I think they're very thoughtful. I think they are very helpful. And I do also think that these discussions, along with all of them, at some point, we need to do another check-in with the whole board on what's our overall homeless program. You know, we're spending, what are we spending on measure A? What are we spending general fund? And then, you know, better understanding longer term um, what opportunities may or may not come our way because of Cal AIM. And I, and I raise that colleagues because I, I recognize that, you know, we're responding to an emergency um, that's still getting bigger, honestly. And, and we, need a, we need to better understand as a board, I think what the sustainability model options are for us. Um, and I think one of the things that's hard for the staff is I think we keep coming to you with the, the gaps in the system and trying to fill them ourselves, and I, what I would, what I would prefer, frankly, is that we're filling those gaps together, that we're having that discussion, and then able to prioritize those. So, um, so thank you, Supervisor Lee. I, I think this is a good direction. I want to thank staff. I think the staff's direction's the right one. I'm very supportive of it, and um, and I, th I think the short-term need issue is one that's really smart because. I, the, the cost, what it costs us to deal with somebody after they've been on the streets without support for a long time is just, you know, th this is a much more along the intervention uh, framework, which I, I like. Thanks, colleagues. Thank you. And I'll conclude before the vote of uh, going back to the very first days, 11 plus years ago, and doing the study and getting the funding from the board back then and providing permanent supportive housing. Then we got into transitional housing, then Jennifer Loving and Destination Home, and then the funding from Cisco and the private sector and our biannual surveys of the homeless population. I heard today where LA is at 45,000 people. Um, Santa Clara County is spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year for at least the last five years on providing housing in numerous ways, transitional, permanent, supportive, full-time, with services. I can't imagine a county anywhere doing a better job than us. But my personal opinion with homeless growing throughout California mm -hmm. is the economy. And that's a great big contributor. We are at the lowest rate of unemployment in some 50 years, but we have more homeless. And most homeless people are not well employed. And so there's really, really, really this, whatever, 98%, 97% of Santa Clara County is employed. San Jose keeps those records. But our unemployment rate, I believe, is around two and a half, three percent and unfortunately, so many of those unemployed 
are part of our homeless. So it's, it's an issue that will never end, but Santa Clara County is doing a great job each and every year trying to be more creative and more supportive of those individuals that need help. And I'm proud of all of us for doing that. With that, Peggy, I'll ask for the final vote of the day on item 25. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. Everything else was held and no items were pulled. So we are going to adjourn this meeting at 1214 today. Have a good lunch, everybody, and uh, keep fighting the fight. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Recording stopped. And with that, this meeting room will be closed. Thank you all for attending and have a great day.